Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the seventh meeting of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee, and we want to welcome all the committee members uh, back from their from the, the Christmas break, uh, and uh, as well as to welcome the staff and to members of the public. This is our very first meeting in 2020. We're very excited to see you here uh, and know that you are joining us. Uh, you can also join the agenda and debate on your computer, tablet, and smartphone. Uh, all you have to do is visit www.toronto.ca uh, backslash uh, council. Backslash, not backsplash. Um, I'm renovating a kitchen, so. The Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee acknowledges the land that we are meeting on is the traditional territories of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat people. And Toronto is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Uh, as we begin our meeting, I'd like to call, are there any declarations of interest under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? Seeing none, thank you. Um, before we continue with this uh, agenda, what I'd like to do is just invite members uh, of our committee to uh, once again uh, introduce themselves and just literally needing you to press the, the microphone in front of you and just state your name. Uh, and I'll, do, I'll start by doing this. It's uh, Kristen Wong Tam, uh, Chair of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee and Local Councillor for Toronto Centre Ward 13. Deirdre Boyle, Accessibility Consultant in the People and Equity Division. Reema Ewick, Member of the Accessibility Advisory Committee. Howard Wax. Wendy Porch, a member of the Accessibility Advisory Committee and Executive Director of the Centre for Independent Living in Toronto. Hi everyone, I'm Bhuvani Sivanasundar, also a member of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee, and my pronouns are she and her. Hello, uh, Michelle Petridis, also a member of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Uh, my pronouns are she and her, and I work for Surrey Place in Developmental Services. Good morning, everyone. My name is Liv Mendelson. I'm the Director of Accessibility and Inclusion at the Miles Nadell Jewish Community Center and a member of this committee. And my pronouns are she and her. Hello, everyone. I'm Carol Costinen, and I work with the City Clerk's Office. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jennifer Ling. I work for City Clerk's Office. Okay, thank you. Maybe we can take the introductions to the outside ring, starting with Wahida. Hi, good morning. My name is Wahida Rahman White. I'm the Director for Equity, Diversity, and Human Rights with the People and Equity Division. And my pronouns are she and her. Hi, I'm, I'm Katia Minion with Parks, Forestry, and Recreation, representing with my consultants, Wallace Emerson Community Center and Park. Uh, it's going to the other side of the room. Good morning, Karen Mills, Accessibility Consultant with the City of Toronto. Good morning, my name is Katisha McGregor with the City Clerk's Office. Good morning, Lynn Genova, Clerk Secretariat. Thank you. And uh, because the staff at the back don't have microphones and I think that we don't have anyone here, we'll just bring it back into committee. Uh, may I have a, oh sorry, before I proceed, I apologize. Uh, today's uh, meeting is actually also a, a cart captioned, and uh, you can see on the screen that this is where you can follow it on your device. Um, I also want to recognize that Karen is, is here. Uh, Karen, who just introduced herself, uh, is going to be providing support. So any members who actually need anything uh, right now, Karen is going to be our, our go-to person. And thank you, Karen, for doing this. Um, may I have a motion to confirm the minutes on November 1st, 2019? Someone who is here. Howard, I saw your hand go up. Okay. Uh, I'll, um, it's moved by Howard. All those in favor? Any opposed? Uh, that is carried. Thank you. So we will proceed to our agenda to go through the order paper. Uh, the first item is DI 7.1, the chair's report, which I will hold and present. Uh, you do have a copy uh, on your on your uh, desk, and also it was sent in advance uh, by way of circulation through the agenda. Item point two, seven point two, Toronto Poverty Reduction Strategy, 2019-2022. There is an action plan up 
update, we'll be holding that because we'll be receiving a staff presentation. Item 7.3, e-scooter oversight and management accessibility feedback. Uh, we will be holding that matter as well because we also have a presentation from the Transportation Services uh, Division. Uh, not to mention that we also have um, deputations that will be, uh, will be coming forward very shortly. Um, 7.4, Wallace Emerson Community Recreation Center and Park Phase 1. Uh, we will be receiving a presentation from Perkin Wills on the Wallace Emerson Community Center uh, and, uh, and all about the accessibility features. So just about every single item is held for now uh, and uh, that brings us to the end of the order paper. Uh, all those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Uh, can I just, uh, I want to raise a, a particular point of, of order and I want to be able to, to share this with the, the committee uh, members and to seek your advice. Uh, we generally here do not receive deputations by way of telephone, um, over telephone, just because sometimes technology doesn't always work, but in this case we've made accommodations. We do have a phone line and we've tested it, everything is fine. Um, but I want to seek uh, the advice of the, of the committee on whether or not you would be agreeable to receiving that deputation over the phone today. Um, are, are there any questions or comments? I've seen lots of nods. Okay, so I think we can proceed then. Um, we'll be receiving a deputation from David Lepofsky, uh, who is requested to speak on item number three, which is the e-scooter item at 1130. So just so you know, it's going to be difficult perhaps to manage exactly uh, when he's available, when we're available, but if with your indulgence, we'll bring that item to, uh, to deputations at 1130 and hopefully we'll be on time. Uh, David's not able to join us, he's teaching a class. Okay, so we'll do that. So coming back to item number one, the chair's report, I'm, it's a fairly long one. I'm not going to go through, um, and I know you're going to be relieved because I'm not going to read every single word, uh, and I promise not to deviate too far from the report, uh, but just recognizing that um, uh, at the high level, I just want to say that on December the 3rd, um, we held at the City of Toronto uh, a celebration of International Day of Persons uh, with Disabilities. It was an incredibly well attended event at Metro Hall. I was asked to read the pro Mayor's proclamation and multiple city divisions participated and I thought that overall um, it was great uh, for us to f concentrate those efforts and actually to deliver a very visible um, uh, presentation. Uh, I was preceded by remarks from Yuli um, Watkins, uh, who is the city's clerk, uh, and she's really the big sponsor of accessibility uh, at the city at the really high level of the office, and she's uh, doing a phenomenal job. Um, so that's uh, most of that component. Um, and uh, what I'll do is, uh, just because this, this report is very long, um, I'll just read per perhaps this just the titles. Uh, Working together, one voice, uh, more choice. Uh, on December the 7th, I brought greetings on behalf of City Council, TAC, uh, to the Alliance for Equality of Blind Canadians at their fourth International Day of Persons with Disabilities event. Uh, again, it was held at Metro Hall, uh, a really well attended event, um, and we heard from fantastic speakers who, uh, who highlighted the best practices that's taking place across sectors. Uh, and uh, I think a lot of us walked away uh, with new learnings. Uh, strategy for reducing poverty. Uh, we will be getting a actual uh, formal staff report on that today. Uh, so I won't necessarily go into the staff report, uh, sorry, my report as the chair, uh, but can just say that uh, the 20, the second plan, sorry, the second phase for the 20 year life cycle of the strategy uh, has begun in 2015 and we'll be hearing more uh, very shortly. Um, I think most people know that we have been having a big debate at city council and in neighborhoods around affordable housing. Uh, the crisis is clearly upon us at the city of Toronto as it is across other urban centers in Canada. Um, and the city of Toronto has just passed their 10-year affordable housing strategy, uh, which includes um, language in the report that stands to benefit people living with disabilities, uh, talking about specifically housing with additional supports. Um, innovation and long-term care at the December 17th and 19th uh, meeting of City Council. 
we approved a new approach for providing care to residents in City of Toronto operated long-term care homes. Uh, we focused on emotion-centered approach, which is a very different way of dealing with uh, del service delivery. Uh, and I think the implementation of this approach includes a 12-month pilot project at Lake Shore Lodge. Um, and eventually it will be rolled out to all of the city's long-term care facilities, and there are 10 in number. Uh, at the December City Council meeting, we also supported a member motion, specifically asking the Ontario government to re reverse its announced cut to social support funding and to urge the provincial government to maintain current definition of disability for the Ontario Disability Support Program. Um, we will have to wait to see what the provincial government says to that particular request. Uh, and then finally, um, budgeting for accessibility. Uh, at the January 17th session, the budget committee uh, directed the chief financial officer and the treasurer to provide an update on the city council item known as uh, EX 8.22, proposed budget process changes to remove systemic barriers to hiring people with disabilities. If you recall, that item was before our committee where we found that there was an inequitable uh, system that was set up where different divisions had to draw upon their own internal divisional budget to pay for accommodations for staff with disabilities. We found that to be unfair, uh, and we said that there needed to be a global budget that all divisions can draw on, so they're not penalized for hiring people with disabilities, but rather it is um, offset by just having that universal accessible uh, budget. So I'm happy to say that um, uh, I, it will be included in this year's 2020 budget, and we want to thank um, members of the Toronto Public Service, really, who are members of that particular, who, who are members of the particular community, who raised the concern and issue for us in the very first place. Uh, and so we didn't necessarily get across the finish line in the two prior years, uh, but we will do so in 2020. Uh, and then finally, we've had some flag raisings and proclamations, uh, including um, proclaiming December 3rd as the International Day of Persons with Disabilities. Uh, and we had um, uh, the theme that this year was part pro promoting the participation of persons with disability and their leadership uh, and making sure that no one is left behind. Um, with that, that is the end of the chair's report. I try to go as quickly as I could, um, but I can, you can tell that even during the holiday break, uh, there was quite a bit of activity. Uh, if I can have someone to move to receive the chair's report. Yeah, uh, Wendy, thank you. All those in favor? And that carries, thank you. So we move to item number two. Um, bring us back to the Toronto Poverty Reduction Strategy 2019 to 2022. This is the action plan update. Uh, we are hearing from Sean McIntyre. Sean, welcome to our committee. Nice to see you. And you can begin anytime. Thank you very much, Chair and members, for inviting uh, the PRS team to, to come back again to your committee and provide the update on the Poverty Reduction Strategy's 2019 to 2022 action plan. Um, so as the Chair mentioned, my name is Sean McIntyre. I'm the Acting Manager of the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office. Um, I'm going to try to quickly go through this presentation um, in respect of everyone's time and get into questions and discussion. Um, but if I'm going too fast at some point, please feel free to uh, slow me down. Um, I'm hoping the presentation will provide a, a brief snapshot of poverty in Toronto, the history and structure of the strategy itself, highlights of the recently approved term action plan, um, as well as briefly touching on the 2020 operating budget submission and items that are connected through the poverty reduction strategy. So who are we? The Poverty Reduction Strategy Office is the main point of contact both within the City of Toronto and with external partners on poverty reduction initiatives. Um, our office is housed within the Social Development, Finance and Administration Division, uh, which is, uh, it functions as the City's lead social policy division on issues related to social inclusion and well-being um, and provides corporate advice on, on those issues. Um, as well as the office specifically provides overall um, coordination of the strategy across divisions. So this slide is a, a it's a little out of date, but it's a helpful visual um, depiction of the face of poverty of Toronto. Um, according to this data, 
just under 400,000 Torontonians live in poverty. Depending on the measure that you use, it could be 500. Regardless, it's a large number. One in five adults live in poverty in Toronto. One in four children live in poverty in Toronto. And it's also well documented that some residents of Toronto are more likely to experience poverty than others. Newcomers, immigrants and refugees, people living with disabilities, singles, lone parents, indigenous Canadians, uh, seniors, youth and racialized communities. The City of Toronto's poverty rate according to the uh, Canada's official poverty line, which I'll touch on in a second, um, is 50% greater than our neighbours in the GTA. It's 70% greater than the province of Ontario and 80% higher than the national rate. The uh, graph on the right um, is just a sample um, comparison across uh, comparative municipalities in, in the country. So as I mentioned, in uh, 2018, uh, the, the government of Canada adopted their own poverty reduction strategy, and with that adopted a official poverty line for Canada, which is called the market basket measure. And it varies by region based on the cost of living in those regions. So what this shows here is that for the typical, in quotes, family of four, two adults and two children, a family that house, whose household income is at $41,000 or below is living in poverty. So a little bit of the history of how we got here. The call for a poverty reduction strategy was anchored on several worrying trends in the city. Across Toronto, there was an increasing and continues to be a concern that growing economic and social inequality are among the most significant threats to the long-term success of Toronto and its residents, perhaps one of the most significant threats. Research and community consultations led to the observation that many in Toronto are struggling to make ends meet, that traditional pathways to prosperity that many of us understand are broken for many, and importantly, that poverty is systemic, it's increasingly gendered, racialized, and concentrated in specific communities and neighbourhoods. Ensuring that every resident of Toronto is able to participate fully in all that Toronto has to offer is a goal that we all share in common. So the motto of our strategy is poverty is everyone's business. So as the Chair mentioned at the top and in her report, in uh, 2015, City Council adopted the Toronto Poverty Reduction Strategy following um, years of consultation with stakeholders, residents, um, city staff, council. Um, it was unanimously, as I said, unanimously adopted by City Council in 2015 and structured, uh, uh, there was a set renewal structure, structure built into the strategy. As it's a 20-year strategy running from 2015 to 2035, staff will be developing and have developed um, five distinct term action plans over the course of the 20-year life cycle. We've completed the first term action plan, 2015 to 2018, and the 2019 to 2022 action plan uh, was recently adopted by City Council in November, and we're beginning the implementation of that this year. Uh, each term plan is an opportunity to review, refresh, and respond to changing contexts, However, the, uh, the themes of the strategy, which I'll talk about in a second, and the 17 Council recommendations will remain constant throughout. This particular action plan is an evolution of the first plan with a much greater emphasis on impact and outcomes, um, ensuring that we engage continuously, that there's transparency and accountability built into our reporting, as well as focusing on leveraging non-traditional partners, uh, both within the City Corporation and externally. So the strategy itself um, focuses on six themes. Housing stability, service access and coordination, transit and transportation equity, food access, quality jobs and livable incomes, and systemic change. There are 17 recommendations that fall within uh, those six uh, categories, and each one of them is tied to one of the following objectives. To address those immediate needs we spoke of earlier, to create new pathways to prosperity or repair broken ones, as well as to drive systemic change. This very messy slide, the details are not very important.
important here, uh, but it's just a quick visual depiction of um, all of the various areas uh, within the city corporation, both our divisions as well as our agencies, boards, and commissions that connect or play a role in one way or another to one or more of the themes uh, and recommendations of the strategy. We use this in our internal consultations to really drive home that key message that poverty is everyone's business, regardless of whether or not the program or service that a particular division is delivering is readily apparently connected to um, issues of poverty. When developing the 2019 to 2022 action plan over the course of the last couple of years, uh, we took a systems of poverty approach to designing our consultations as well as developing the, the concrete actions that were ultimately included in the plan. Uh, with a focus on the Toronto context, really in order to help us clarify which interventions m would be most effective and strategically impactful. Again, this is a slide where the details are not important for this conversation, but it is in your package. Um, and this is the systems map that we used in the development of the recommend or the actions within our service access theme. Um, and the various flowchart there shows um, issues of resident need, inputs from governments and other, um, other stakeholders, program design elements to ensure accessibility um, and availability and affordability, leading to, at the bottom, sort of the desired outcomes, sort of a logic model approach to why we are recommending what we are recommending, linking to those outcomes we hope to achieve. It's by no means a comprehensive map, um, but it was a helpful thought exercise for us. Provincial and federal governments have a very significant role to play in poverty reduction, primarily through their ability to redistribute income, which municipalities do not have. However, the direct impacts of poverty are often borne by the city through the services and supports that are offered. And as such, mitigating the impacts of and attempting to reduce poverty is a core business for municipal governments and an area in which the city can have an impact. And this is, uh, this is seen um, uh, across Canada now as many municipalities have their own poverty reduction strategies. This particular term action plan is placing a, a much more deliberate focus on utilize, identifying and utilizing the controls that a municipal government has to drive systemic change. While the city is very dependent on support and funding from other orders of government, there are a number of formal and informal relationships that can be leveraged, such as working closely with our community-based not-for-profit sector to deliver locally relevant and responsive programs and services. This slide um, identifies uh, six areas of, uh, or levers that the city has that we use to um, uh, tie all of our actions into, uh, into one of these six areas. And those are service provision, we provide direct services, we play a role in policy development and regulating certain industries, um, we are uh, a direct funder to community-based organizations, we also play a leadership role as Canada's sixth largest government. Um, what we do here in Toronto is noticed and recognized in other orders of government, and uh, we hope to play a leadership role um, by leading through example. Um, we also are uh, stewards. We can play a role in facilitating conversations, convening uh, partners that haven't worked together in the past to tackle thorny issues. And then, of course, we have significant purchasing and investment power. When we let contracts, we spend a lot of money, and how we choose to spend that um, can uh, have a huge impact on, on residents of Toronto. And I'll talk about that in greater detail in a few minutes. I'm now just going to go through the themes and the specific recommendations from the strategy, and then the highlights of what the, uh, in our term action plan, what we're focusing on over the next four years. So the three recommendations in housing are to improve the quality of all affordable housing, to assist low-income individuals and families to secure and maintain affordable housing, and to increase the supply of affordable housing. However, there aren't any specific actions in this term action plan on housing stability. The reason for that is that concurrently with the development of our plan, as the chair mentioned earlier, the city's long-term housing plan was uh, being developed and adopted at the same time. However, uh, we do, uh, those, these two strategies interconnect with one another, and so we do have a number of actions uh, throughout the poverty reduction strategy that will 
complement and contribute to the city's ongoing housing efforts. For example, implementing the community benefits framework, developing community capacity and locally inclusive economic development models, facilitating community engagement with Toronto residents, as well as prioritizing monitoring and evaluation of the outcomes both within our strategy and the housing strategy. In the area of service access and coordination, there are two recommendations. The first focuses on increasing service, service access and availability across the city. And the second is to specifically uh, target improving access to high quality programs for children and youth. Uh, this term action plan strives to ensure that low-income residents can more easily discover and access consistent, predictable human services that deliver the outcomes that they are intended to achieve. And this will be done by leveraging existing public assets, services, and forming new partnerships to make supports more accessible for low-income residents, evaluating program delivery model models to maximize positive client and service user outcomes, pushing forward seamless service delivery and breaking down silos that create barriers for residents, supporting the city's review of youth services and continuing to implement the child care growth and capital strategies. In the area of transit and transportation, our two recommendations are to increase affordability for low-income residents as well as to improve transit service in the inner suburbs. A note on that, um, and this is an example of uh, while the recommendations are consistent, they are meant to evolve. Um, the, the second recommendation is really about exploring and incubating ways to improve connectivity for low-income residents right across Toronto. Um, the inner suburbs are identified because there is um, a significant lack of connectivity that is observed there. So we're working closely with the Toronto Transit Commission on service planning and ensuring that an equity-based approach is utilized when decisions are made. And then, of course, we have the low-income transit fair pass program that is continuing to be rolled out. In the area of food access, uh, the recommendations are to eliminate hunger as well as to increase access to affordable, nutritious and culturally appropriate food. The term action plan aims to improve access for low-income children to nutritious foods and ensures low-income residents can participate in healthy, equitable and sustainable food systems by investing in programs and services that address food insecurity, promoting healthy, equitable and sustainable food systems. And one example of a direct program is the student nutrition program. In the area of quality jobs and livable incomes, our recommendations are to improve the quality of and access to income supports, to create opportunities, employment opportunities for low-income groups with high unemployment rates and who are distant from the labor market, and to improve the quality of jobs. We plan to do this through embedding financial empowerment into city programs and services, monitoring and responding appropriately to proposed social assistance program changes, including the potential changes to ODSP eligibility, as well as advancing inclusive economic development initiatives such as community benefits, social procurement, and other anchor institution strategies where we work closely with our other uh, large public sector institutions to share best practices. And finally, um, under the area of systemic change, and this is really the exciting one for us, um, our recommendations are to leverage that economic power that the city has to stimulate job growth, support local businesses and drive inclusive economic growth, to create a seamless social support system. The implementation of the Human Services Integration Program is part of that. Um, to coordinate and evaluate the implementation of the Toronto Pub Poverty Reduction Strategy and to utilize our monitoring and evaluation framework across the corporation. Um, to engage city staff and residents on our efforts on poverty reduction, as well as to dedicate funding to actions. A few examples of some work that we'll be doing this term under systemic change is to develop a corporate-wide policy framework to guide when the city will deliver programs and services on a universal or a targeted basis, including consideration of appropriate levels of subsidies and fees. Uh, as I said, implementing a continuous engagement model, recruiting the second cohort of our lived experience advisory group, which is part of our accountability structure, 20 residents from across Toronto with lived experience of poverty, um, advise us and work closely with us on implementation of the strategy. We're in the process of recruiting the second cohort as we speak. 
Um, as mentioned, uh, establishing a robust monitoring and evaluation regime and establishing reporting mechanisms based on that, um, as well as partnering with the Indigenous communities of Toronto to um, develop an urban Indigenous-led poverty reduction action plan led by community um, to complement the initiatives of the city, and we'll be supporting those efforts. And finally, um, and sorry, this was sent out in the supplemental package. Um, we, uh, as we're in the middle of the budget process right now, uh, we thought it would be useful to share the Poverty Reduction Strategy budget briefing note, which describes corporate-wide various initiatives that are before Council right now for decision that connect in some way to the Poverty Reduction Action Plan. Um, so just a couple of highlights on budgeting. Um, since the adoption of the strategy in 2015, Council has approved and directed approximately $266 million gross and $181 million net in the operating budget for new and enhanced initiatives. It's important to note that this does not include capital investments and programs that are funded by other orders of government. While those are significant contributions as well, uh, we haven't had a consistent reporting mechanism to capture those. Um, however, we are embarking on doing that. We'll be reporting to City Council in July on the total um, amount spent, both in terms of new and enhanced initiatives, as well as what's happening within the base day-to-day -day operations of the city um, on poverty reduction initiatives or programs to support low-income residents, as well as attempting to capture the um, both the the spend in our capital budget, as well as the value of the assets that we have that can um, be categorized as contributing to poverty reduction. Uh, we hope that that ambitious effort will allow us to establish a baseline um, and demonstrate that poverty reduction really is the core business of the municipality and will allow us to measure progress going forward. In the current staff recommended operating budget, um, there is approximately $15 million gross and $5 million net that have been submitted of new and enhanced initiatives. So these are not ongoing programs, um, these are new programs. Um, and I don't know if we want to go over them, but the, uh, the list there are, are, is the sum total of those 15. And again, they, there are other new and enhanced initiatives that could be considered poverty reduction, but to be very clear and attribute specific spending items to the strategy, we only identified those initiatives that do connect to one or more of the actions in our strategy. And with that, I will conclude my remarks. I'm sorry that took a bit longer than I had intended. Um, and I'm happy to entertain any questions or discussion that there may be. John, thank you very much for your presentation, and definitely you will be receiving some questions. We're going to start with Wendy. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And it's nice to have you back to tell us more about um, the poverty reduction strategy, because of course you were here talking to the committee previously about uh, the strategy and the action plan and the impact for people with disabilities. So at that time, you know, I think one of the things we talked about was whether or not people with disabilities were um, apparent in the action plan and were they considered. And so I'm very happy to see that people with disabilities are included in who you're identifying as living with poverty. I wanted to ask about the actions that you have outlined. Um, which of those actions do you think are going to be the most impactful for people with disabilities? And how would you know that they were successful? I'll start with the, the second part of the question. Um, for all of our actions, the how do you know is, um, is important for us to figure out how to do. Because right now we have been, and, and this is a struggle right across um, the country in terms of monitoring and evaluating the impact of programs on whether or not people are better off. We're really good at reporting um, administratively how many people are accessing programs, how much did we spend on them. Um, but in many cases, and certainly not all, but in many cases, the logical next step of is anyone better off is a very difficult question to answer. So as part of the development of our monitoring and evaluation framework, we are mapping out an approach to do that. We'll be piloting it in a number of programs that the city delivers right now that already have some data collection that we can leverage to pilot, pilot best practices. Um, so that's a stay tuned answer, if I could tell you, where this year is 
there's going to be a lot of background work on developing that structure with an aim to be reporting to council annually on those outcomes, not the inputs to the strategy. That's our goal. On the first question, um, we see that the actions, and in the, uh, I believe in the agenda, um, there is a link to the action plan. There are 89 actions, uh, sorry, there are 31 actions um, and 89 sub-activities. Um, they're all very high level for the most part. Um, the, the actions all have embedded with them, within them an equity, um, an equity approach and recognizing that different communities will feel the impact of those actions in different ways and there may need to be targeted approaches within them. I would say as it specifically relates to, um, uh, uh, to people with disabilities, um, we are working with uh, people in equity on, um, on employment issues and there was the, the mention that the chair made at the top around budgeting for that. Um, I'd say that's one area where there's a lot of promise. Um, accessibility really comes into our conversations with the Toronto Transit Commission as well in, the, um, in their service planning. Um, not the AODA stuff that they're doing anyhow with the low floor buses and the streetcars, but um, ensuring that when they're doing service planning and identifying um, outside of the wheel trans component uh, with conventional transit um, route patterns that matter for distinct communities with specific needs. Um, so they've developed an equity planning tool that is being piloted this year and very much uh, people with disabilities are right at the top of the list of groups that are in consideration there. Those are a couple of examples, but certainly not an exhaustive list. Do you have a follow-up question? Yes, you do. You have time. Um, so I'm going to make comments after this. Yeah. I'll just ask questions, right? Has there been, you mentioned that there's a uh, interest in developing an Indigenous Poverty Reduction Action Plan. Has there been any consideration for a Persons with Disabilities Poverty Reduction Action Plan? Uh, not specifically initiated via us. However, I believe that perhaps through the lessons learned in the development of an Urban Indigenous Poverty Reduction Action Plan, because it's a unique model that, that we haven't done before, so we're just grappling with that now. I believe that the model certainly could be appropriate and would be more than happy to work with this committee on exploring those opportunities. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, our next uh, member to question is Bhuvani, and then Liv. Hi, uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, so you, you earlier mentioned that you're putting together a cohort of people with lived experiences. I was just wondering what initiatives or efforts um, you've undertaken, if any, to ensure that people with, uh, with different accessibility uh, needs and people with disabilities are, are comprised in the cohort. Absolutely. Um, so the, there was a very robust recruitment process. Um, of course, the applications are open to all Toronto residents, but we relied on our community partners that work with particular um, equity-seeking groups and, and communities to, uh, to get the word out. We received roughly 350 applications. Um, we're in the process of uh, now fine-tuning that and doing interviews to get down to 20. Um, the, the interviews are happening, in fact, they just happened this weekend. Um, and the new cohort will come in in April. Um, I can't share the composition right now, but I can tell you that a significant number of applicants who, who in that group of 350, as well as those that are, um, are being shortlisted, self-identify as people with disabilities. And that was the same in the last cohort. Um, the, uh, the process for selection ensures um, intersectionality on, on the committee. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? No? Liv, please go ahead. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I, my initial question was sort of an echo of, of Wendy's, um, which was just um, looking at how you would measure impact in each of these specific groups. So I think you've started to address that. I wanted to ask you about your overall equity lens because so many of these areas uh, I think would require sort of an umbrella equity lens rather than program by program. 
um, when you look at service access, improving service access overall, and for youth and children, um, how you know how will um, the needs of people with disabilities and accessibility barrier removal um, play into that? And similarly, uh, transit, employment, all of these areas. So I'm wondering if you have an overall equity lens that you're applying across the board. Yeah, absolutely. So the strategy itself is an equity-based strategy, and an equity-based lens was is utilized at all times, both on the development of all of the actions as well as um, as well as the specific actions and their implementation. Um, so we work very closely with people in equity um, within our division uh, and the social policy team. There are individuals working on disaggregated data. Um, so we're all we're all working together on. on on that as well as equity responsive budgeting. And is that is there a formal um, like equity tool that you're using that's across the board or is it sort of program by program kind of subgroup of people working on things by subgroup of people? The formal tool is through the budgeting process, the equity responsive budgeting. That's okay. the tool that exists. But the principles within that tool can be applied to programs. Can be applied across the board. Okay, thank you. And if I can just one more uh, follow up. Um, the list of programs, the new spending that we saw, can you identify um, which of those pieces of new spending you think will be most um, uh, impactful for pe persons with disabilities? Um, I would say, based on this particular list, and remember this is not exhaustive of everything in the budget, they're just the new and enhanced that are tied to ours. Um, the uh, Low Income Seniors Dental Care Plan, um, perhaps creating Health Plus, which is a food initiative within the shelter system, would be two. Okay, thank you. Worth, worth exploring for sure. Yeah. There are, sorry, if I could just, there are other initiatives such as the, um, the funding that was referenced earlier on internal hiring, which I would say are, is interconnected and complementary, doesn't show up on this list because it, it's happening elsewhere. And there's a lot of that, and that's a, with this new action plan, we're trying to show where the value add of the strategy is, as opposed to not comprehensively listing everything that the city is doing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any other members who would like to ask questions? Okay. Uh, seeing none, Sean, I'm just going to take a, a, a few minutes to ask some questions myself. Hmm. The, the overall theme of, of the, the questions coming from the members is around accountability and how do we make sure that what you say is happening is indeed happening with the resulted benefits for the community living with disabilities. So I want to understand your evaluation framework. In the absence of good disaggregated data, so who is the population that you're trying to serve? How do you measure the outcome in, in quantifiable um, uh, ways that we can all see? Mm -hmm. So that is, that's our challenge um, that we are working with right now. And as part of the strategy, Council approved our monitoring and evaluation framework. Um, we are starting this year utilizing a results-based accountability approach to identify eight particular programs that fall within the poverty reduction strategy. Um, to do comprehensive data collection, including disaggregated data within that, in order to report on those outcomes, to get to a, is anyone better off? So within those eight that were selected, some have robust data already, others will require the development of a data collection strategy. Um, so between now and September, um, we will work through those eight, and we're hoping that if we're successful with that, that will be applied to the remaining actions, that process, and the reporting to council when we come back every year through the budget process and report on how much we spent, we'll also be reporting on how well did we do and is anyone better off. That is the goal. Thank you. And is the, the, the collection of disaggregated data the responsibility of each division, or is it an overarching corporation responsibility? Who, who's in charge? In the case of the seven, or the eight, sorry, that we're piloting right now, we'll be overseeing that, working with our divisional partners to identify what data is required um, to, to be able to successfully report on outcomes. So your office, the Poverty Reduction Strategy Office, is overseeing the, the data collection? In some cases, the divisions will be doing the collection of data, but there's a, a monitoring and evaluation team that is being developed right now, which includes 
staff from all of the divisions that are implicated in those eight pilots um, who will be sitting at a table that we lead on this strategy. And how do you ensure that there isn't, um, oh, thank you, the fan is finally off. This is great. Um, and thank you, everyone, for your gross uh, uh, investments in operating. But it doesn't tell me who's getting it, when is it being spent. Um, so so how, do, how do we ensure that accountability here, especially for this particular committee? So the, the attachment to that attachment, the big colored chart, breaks down that entire $266.5 million. Again, that's just new and enhanced from 2015 to 2020 that were um, identified as flowing out of the poverty reduction strategy. And so at the time that council was considering those budgets, they existed within the package that we were calling poverty reduction strategy initiatives. However, your point about double counting is an important one, which is why the numbers often seem smaller than what the city is actually spending because we're trying to be very clear to council and the public that these initiatives flow out of the poverty reduction strategy. That's where the value add comes in. And then the impact for this particular community, because I think for, for this mm -hmm. committee, there, there's always a desire to know, well, what's changed for people who are living in poverty, who can't get on transit, who will stay in poverty because they can't get access to transit, so they can't get to work. So there's this, there's this constant loop of, of information presented, consultation mm -hmm. goes out, and I would say uh, for a lot of folks who've been engaged in these discussions for a number of years, they feel like we're not getting much further, and in many cases, uh, people are saying that things are getting worse. So then how would we make that shift? That was my last question. Mm -hmm. I would say that that, um, that observation is, is correct and it is felt by many communities in Toronto. Um, and again, there was a bit of a sobering tone to our staff report on the fact that while we do have, we do have this strategy and the city is investing significant funds on, um, on issues related to poverty, the reality is our impact is more around mitigation as opposed to reduction, and that the big tools, the big moves, happen elsewhere. And it, that's not meant to um, uh, sound like an abdication of responsibility. The city does have a responsibility, but that recognition is real. It's why we are not reporting on tremendous successes that people are better off. Mm -hmm. However, our framework, our monitoring and evaluation framework, is structured in such a way to allow us to accurately say uh, to indicate that publicly. We're just not there yet. Okay, thank you very much. We aim to get there. And we'd be very um, happy to have a conversation as well to ensure that we're not missing anything in our, um, as we're reporting on those eight, that we're capturing people with disabilities in an appropriate way. And I'd be happy to bring that back informally or formally to, uh, to the members here to, to gain that feedback. Okay, Sean, thank you. Any other members for a question? We'll move into remarks. I know that Wendy had her hand up and Wendy to speak first. Thank you. Um, I, I was heartened to see at the start of your uh, presentation the acknowledgement that poverty impacts everybody and it involves everybody. Um, and it, it certainly is everyone's business. People with disabilities, as we've discussed here frequently at this committee, are historically underemployed. Uh, if you're living on ODSP, you are most certainly living in poverty. Um, but my concern, and just to echo some of what Councillor Wong Tam has said, my concern is that many of the initiatives outlined will still miss people with disabilities. So for example, the Fair Pass uh, initiative provides access to a transit system that is still largely inaccessible. Uh, it's a transit system that is rolling out the Family of Services program, um, which is requiring people with disabilities to use the regular transit system in light of it even still not being accessible. Uh, Wheeltrans is currently reevaluating people and, you know, putting conditions on their access to the system. So, you know, whether or not that is actually going to make a difference in terms of people with disabilities being able to access transit and being able to therefore have a job and move out of poverty is questionable for me. Uh, the Toronto, the City of Toronto Housing Action Plan, um, you know, there's mention in that plan of uh, accessible housing. Um, but we don't know what accessible means yet in the context of that plan. So there are ranges of accessible. There's accessible for frail seniors, and then there's accessible for somebody who uses a power wheelchair that weighs 200 pounds. And we don't know what that looks like yet, so the impact of whether or not, 
you know, how that's going to roll out and whether it actually has a good impact on the outcomes for people with disabilities is still outstanding. Uh, the accessibility of program provision here, so uh, many programs take place in, in inaccessible locations. Uh, the methods for enrolling in programs or accessing them are inaccessible. Uh, so improving, you know, sort of poverty reduction through the accessibility of programs is still going to be held up by the fact that most of that is still inaccessible to people with disabilities. So, um, you know, this is why I wanted to know specifically from you what is the what are the programs that are going to have the biggest impact for our population? And to me, it sounds like it's not even clear yet. Um, there is an opportunity in the poverty reduction strategy for you to act as an umbrella and pull together um, some of these programs and also move the needle for people with disabilities if you require that the, out the outcomes and outputs of those programs are accessible. So if you work into that action plan that any of these programs and projects and initiatives, the outcomes have to be accessible and we have to know what the impact is on people with disabilities, then you would actually have some room for impact. But at the moment, I don't see it, unfortunately. Um, the, another recommendation I wanted to make is that when you're developing your strategy in terms of understanding the impact, because I understand that's where you're saying you're at in terms of evaluation, you, you have to be able to call out people with disabilities in those outcomes. So in terms of the, the methodology that you use to uh, structure your evaluation, there has to be a way to acknowledge and, and identify people with disabilities in order to be able to know whether we've had any improvements. So I would recommend that that gets considered now because you're doing that now. And finally, I wanted to say, you know, I really, I'd be open to working with you, and I'm sure many people on the committee here too would be, if you were to look at the development of a Persons with Disabilities Poverty Reduction Action Plan. Uh, people with disabilities are, they constitute at least 60, 65, 68 percent of people with disability, or people living in poverty generally in terms of the stats that we have. Um, but there's no specific attention being paid to this community. And so if there's a way for us to work together to do that sooner rather than later, then I would be certainly open to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Wendy, for your remarks. Uh, Liv, to speak? Once again, I'm, I'm uh, echoing Wendy's remarks. I also just want to highlight when you're doing your planning for evaluation and data collection, I mean, this committee is well aware that the basic data collection around people with disabilities in Toronto is quite lacking. It's uh, very hard to count and identify to begin with. Um, so the, the work that you do will, is, is going to be layered over that challenge and to be really aware. Uh, we don't have good data. We don't collect the data um, in any kind of strategic way in the city at this point. Um, so that's something to build into your process as you're thinking about trying to identify all of those subgroups that we saw on your uh, with, with your icons of the different uh, groups uh, impacted. Uh, thank you very much, Liv. Anyone else to speak? Um, seeing none, I have uh, a motion that's not going to be too surprising, I think, given the, the tenure of, uh, of our conversation so far. I'll just start my clock. Uh, I will ask the clerk to put it on the screen. Um, the motion is to have uh, TAC recommend the City Council develop a Persons with Disabilities Poverty Reduction Action Plan and to report back to this committee in the fourth quarter of 2020. Um, I recognize that it may seem like it's a very accelerated um, uh, body of work, but considering that the uh, Poverty Reduction Action Plan and the discussions uh, preceding that, uh, number one, dated a, a decade ago, the plan was developed uh, and initiated in 2015. Uh, we at this committee, I don't think, has seen enough movement in terms of moving that dial for progress. Uh, so I'm hoping that you don't have to start from scratch. You've got people with lived experiences who are providing advice to, uh, to staff. You've got a body of work that has been uh, obviously clearly researched and documented. But for the community who is actually most impacted by, by poverty, especially as it, as it relates to those who sit on this committee, uh, I think we're hoping to see more. Uh, we definitely, I personally definitely support having that Indigenous-led poverty reduction focus. I think that's critical, especially as we uh, in Canada are moving to conversations about reconciliation. But we also know that people living with disabilities are oftentimes the unforgotten, uncounted. Um, and, uh, and in the absence of, of good data, uh, we're going to need to sharpen our pencils and focus that work. The, the city has adopted a, um, a, a, a strategy regarding collecting disaggregated data. 
data. It's something that has been woefully missing for the most hyper diverse city in the world, with which delivers hundreds of thousands of programs and, and services to communities without real tangible benchmarks on whether or not our dollars, which are our investments and they're limited, are reaching the communities that we intend. So we continue to develop strategies and we continue to, to develop, um, I think, you know, very ambitious goals, but we have a hard time tracking which means that it becomes very difficult to then re-engage uh, for communities that are coming out to do consultations to, you know, we, we thought we told you what we wanted and not, and I'm just saying hypothetically, um, and we didn't get to see the outcome. Um, you, you were asked a question, Sean, about what was the most important, uh, perhaps, program coming up in the 2020 budget based on what was on the screen. Um, the one thing I, I would probably take not necessarily take note of the one thing I would have identified as one of the most important um, uh, outcomes is actually the intersectional gender equity unit. Um, there has not been good data collection, disaggregated data collection at the city. It's very, very hard to tailor the services and program and also find the, the obstacles and challenges of different people who cannot get access to service until we actually know who our clients are, which is called them clients and they're re residents of Toronto. Um, so this is why I think it's, it's always been very difficult to nail that outcome. By having an intersectional gender equity unit, uh, recognizing that 52% of the population are women, a very large population of them are actually living with disabilities who are living with poverty and other type of intersectional positions based on their identities and, and where they sit in society. And oftentimes they're living with harm, more violence, uh, fewer access to employment, fewer access to, to housing, fewer access to, to just social services. If we can get to a solid place of strong and accurate disaggregated data collection, we will move the dial, not just on poverty reduction, but in terms of everything else that the city is trying to do with respect to equity. In the absence of that, which is to me the underlying foundational work that needs to be done first, um, we will continue to develop strategies and not be able to get good evaluation um, uh, measured outcomes. So that's my, my request is to hopefully we can work together and there's lots of energy at, at this particular committee and outside these, this committee I know that the members are representing much larger uh, memberships within their agencies that they represent. They all really want to focus on this issue. Um, so you have a lot of champions, they're in your court, they want to work with you and hopefully we can do this work together. Um, thank you very much. If there are no other speakers then perhaps we can just take a vote on this particular matter. Okay, all those in favor of the motion, uh, any opposed, that carries. And thank you, Sean, for your presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, so we are moving to our next uh, item. And our next item is, oh, I'm asked to, perhaps we can vary the order paper because we did say we were gonna time, uh, Sean, thank you. We we're gonna time David Pop uh, Popovsky's um, deputation for 11.30, so why don't we just move item number four, which is the Wallace Emerson Community Center, Recreation Center and Park Phase 1 Accessibility Features, and we'll bump you to this particular time slot, and then we'll save e-scooter as the last item so we can time it with David's uh, deputation. Good. Are you ready? Okay, great. Sorry, folks. Um, all those in favor of uh, reordering that? Okay, item number four before item number three. Any opposed? That carries. Thank you.
Uh, when you're ready, I'll start your clock, and I think we allocated 10 minutes for your presentation. Okay, go ahead. Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Blois. I'm with Perkins and Will, a uh, member of the design team for the new Wallace Emerson Community Center, uh, joined by my colleague Ben uh, Wattmeyer from Public Work, who's in, uh, a member of the design team on the landscape side. So we're going to work back and forth to, to present this center to you. <clears throat> so I'm not sure if everyone's familiar with um, uh, the existing gallery and mall and the proposed redevelopment. Um, our project is a, is a part of that redevelopment in the uh, northwest corner um, with the community center and then further down to the south of that area with the park as well. So um, the, the mall is being taken down in stages and, and buildings are going up and the park uh, to, the, uh, to the south is, is happening in two phases. So we're part of the first phase. So the, the building um, comprises, uh, is comprised of a 25-meter uh, lane, uh, lane swimming pool, leisure pool, uh, a gym with a running track, a childcare center, uh, multi-purpose rooms, dance and aerobics and fitness studios, and some administration offices for the, uh, uh, for the parks and rec staff. The park uh, has a childcare playground, multi-use skate trail, BMX skateboard park, multi-sport court, uh, water play features and community gathering spaces. So it's a really kind of exciting and, and going to be a really active uh, part of the community. Um, in terms of our uh, detailed work, we're we're following uh, and and closely um, working with the OBC Ontario Building Code, um, the AODA, uh, the City of Toronto's Accessibility Design Guidelines, uh, still in their uh, draft form, but we're working with them on this project and the uh, child care design technical guideline as well. So I think the, the overall uh, layout of the, of the site, being part of a larger master plan, um, this, uh, this center looks to kind of carve out really important public spaces and, uh, and, and frame them with, with the building and with uh, uh, really important features in the landscape as well. Um, so just overall, the, the community center um, with the child care built into it sits at the north um, uh, west corner of the site. And then there's a field house building as well that has uh, skate change and uh, some services for the park housed in it. So the two together form this space in the middle that we're calling the forum, um, kind of an important uh, public gathering area. Uh, there's also a skate trail in a, in a figure eight pattern that, that works its way through that whole space and a BMX and skateboard feature as well. And that's a view of that space that we're calling the forum looking uh, to the north. Um, so on the left hand side you have the community center and then the right hand side is the field house. So really colorful kind of um, exciting form in the, in the landscape. And then just, these are just a few views that we're showing of the building first, then we'll get back into the plan. Um, but just to kind of set the tone for the, uh, for the feel of the building, um, it's quite open, very visually connected to all the levels, um, warm with, uh, with wood finishes, um, and, uh, and, and quite strong contrast between floor and wall and, um, and a very neutral palette in, in general. So in general, getting getting from where you know where you where you are, either the bus stop or your car or or walking from nearby neighborhoods to the community center, um, has been thoroughly considered uh, in in the in the project. So um, access from uh, from all of the the spaces around, including the laneway, um, have all been thought through. We really think of this as a four sided uh, four sided building. And um, you know, meeting all the standards, of course, 2,100 millimeter wide, 5% uh, sloped uh, walkways at the most, and we have a combination of concrete paving and unit pavers, um, all on a very stable base, uh, meant to be quite quite even and and not have uh, uh, transitions between them. I think I'm going to uh, turn it over to to Ben to go through a few slides um, on the landscape side.
This slide is showing a few routes of access to the community center. So from a bus stop along DuPont Street, uh, direct access into the, the front entrance of the community center, as well as a new street that is connecting DuPont and Dreffrin, which provides access to the park, as well as the laneways. Within the park, one of the primary design features is a figure eight skating trail, which in the winter, of course, will be used for skating, but during the summer, it provides an accessible pathway with uh, flush, smooth transitions to the adjacent uh, walkways and gathering spaces. This is a view into the forum from the new street, uh, showing uh, plenty of uh, gathering areas with accessible seating. There will also be um, a water play and splash pad area, uh, which we are proposing uh, temporary benches uh, to provide an indication that uh, someone is moving into a water area where they may get splashed. Uh, this is a view of the skating trail in summertime, so it becomes just a smooth, wide open walkway. And in the winter, uh, the skating trail is flush with the adjacent pavements. Uh, because the ice will build up a little bit higher on the surface, um, there will be a slight difference in elevation. Uh, we're planning to provide uh, temporary benches as well in the winter to kind of indicate that uh, potential hazard of ice. Okay. Okay, so we're switching back to the floor plan now. So this is of the main, main community center. Um, highlighted in, in yellow are all the, the sort of major program areas and then spaces in between uh, in white are, are primarily circulation spaces or, or change rooms. Um, so all entrance doors will have power door operators, level transition. Um, main entrance doors, we're actually looking to change them to automatic sliding doors. That's not in this plan, but it's, it's in, the, in development. Um, the other important point is, is once you come in uh, to the lobby from, from the front entrance, you can see the service desk right away, and you're also very close by to where the, um, to where the elevator is. I'm just, if, for anyone who can uh, sort of see the, the white contrast on there with the, with the mouse, I'm just circling the, the elevator location in red there. Um, now, the service desk um, and, and, and all of the millwork conforming, of course, to the accessibility standard and having barrier-free routes throughout. Um, second level, uh, again, more, more uh, program spaces uh, coming up from the elevator, um, lots of circulation, uh, free area around, and, um, uh, and lounge areas to, to wait, for, uh, wait for programs outside the rooms. One universal washroom up on this level, and uh, two drinking fountains uh, slash bottle fill uh, stations as well. And then the third level um, is a walking track around the interior of the gym, and then also, um, in good weather, a chance to go out on the um, on the rooftop and and go on around a walking track there. Which will be a really nice feature. You're surrounded by a green roof, um, the view of the immediate park, and then the new development beyond. Now the, so the field house building is is even with the uh, the ground level of the community center, um, just at the other side of the forum, and it's uh, it's kind of divided in half. the The bottom half is more of a service space, not accessible to the public, but the top space is a skate change room and snack bar. Um, has a, a service counter where you can go for for snacks and for um, uh, lending out skates and other other things. Um, there's four washrooms, uh, some lockers as well, um, and it's, it's also kind of a flexible space that can be used for for many many different things in, in the other uh, um, other seasons. The childcare playground um, is a secured uh, kind of separate place ground around the, the south and east sides of the, the community center. Um, and I'll just read through the, the key points of that. So uh, minimal walking barriers, paving transitions are flush, accessible play surfaces uh, through the use of rubber, low sandboxes with an elevated water table, enabling wheelchair access, ample opportunity for a variety of play, not limited to gross motor development, um, but also creative, imaginative, 
imaginative play through blackboards, acrylic panels, sand, playhouse, and uh, decking materials. It's also a provision of areas to observe the play happening if you're not uh, uh, directly involved in it. In terms of the washrooms, um, again, these are all uh, meeting the, the new um, uh, design guideline with 2,500 millimeter turning radius. And the ones that, uh, that are not have at least a 1,700 uh, turning radius, just the, the distinction between a universal versus a barrier-free washroom. And, and of course, everything, uh, including the power door operators and, and all of the accessories that go along with that. The washrooms are generally arranged as a unisex uh, setup, so it's not uh, not kind of just going to a male female um, bank of washrooms, but you have your own um, your own kind of private room with a sink and uh, and a toilet. And within the aquatic change rooms, um, they're set up much like uh, a number of the new community facilities around the city. Um, like the Regent Park Aquatic Center, for example, where it's a unisex change room. Um, you have individual change stalls and, uh, and fully separated uh, uh, toilet rooms. Um, within that, there, there are two universal change rooms and two uh, accessible change stalls available. It's, it's set up to be divided into two for purposes of cleaning. You could close down one half, so the, um, the features are the same on both sides. Within the pool, uh, both pools, the, the leisure pool and the lane pool are um, accessible by ramp. Um, and there are also warm uh, or, or uh, dry sort of viewing areas within the lobby and uh, on deck viewing as well um, that will all be uh, meeting accessibility standards. In terms of the finishes, um, just to give uh, sort of a quick overview, again, uh, it's quite a neutral palette, but we're thinking of quite quite strong um, uh, contrast between the floor and, and the wall. Um, and uh, we're, we're now kind of getting into the details of this and working in um, the tactile indicators and, and the, other, um, uh, the other more detailed elements of the, of the design at this stage. So I think we, we just wanted to uh, uh, leave a few questions at the end of our, end of our presentation, maybe to, to get the discussion going. Um, so I'll just I'll quickly read through all three and then, um, and then I'll, I'll conclude with that. So in, in general, uh, we believe that the high con contrast approach to the interior finishes, the open and visually connected layout, make this a facility that's welcoming, welcoming to everyone in the community. We would like to hear about any concerns you may have with the design or suggestions to achieve an even higher level of accessibility. Number two, um, are there any issues that you've encountered at any recently completed facilities that you think should be avoided in this one? And I say recently completed because of course standards have, have changed and knowing there's, there are definitely many, many issues with older facilities. So that was a uh, distinction there. Um, and then number three, um, since the City of Toronto Accessibility Design Guideline is still in a draft form, are there any items as they re relate to this type of building um, that you think should be reconsidered or that we, we should think about it in a different way? Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation. Um, and uh, I think there might be some questions for you, uh, starting with Liv. Okay. I have, uh, thank you very much. I have several questions. So, Councillor Wong Tam, you can let me know. Uh, when to stop asking. Uh, you've got five minutes. I just started your clock. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, when you identified um, the pathways to enter the center, have you planned for a designated wheel trans stop? Yes, we have. And I just, I'm not sure how clear it's going to be on the site plan, but I will uh, I'll just bring that up. Yeah, I don't think it was labeled, but I imagine yeah, you've, right. you've considered that. Um, <clears throat> question about the pool. I see that you have... Uh, ramped access to both uh, pools, which is great. There are people who cannot use ramps. Are you planning to have a, a pool lift as well? Uh, we, uh, we haven't heard that yet, so we can absolutely integrate that if, if that's the case. Yeah, you need a certain um, level of mobility to be able to power through a ramp, so I would recommend building into the structure the capacity to have a, a pool lift. lift okay. um, uh, I would also ask you about the washrooms if you've built in the capacity to have 
uh, lifts for changing, whether you're gonna put the lifts into the ceilings now or whether it's for, for you know, just for planning purposes for the future, at the time that you are building it is, mm -hmm. is when you wanna make sure you have the structural capacity to, right. to do that. Right, and, that, and that's to make the transfer from one side of the room to the other side of the room. Yep. Yes, okay, it hasn't been planned for us so far, but it can, and, and if, so if we were to build that in, would we do that, do you think for all of the universals or for a particular? I mean, it's some, it, to some extent budget dependent. If you could do it for all, that would be um, a very welcome um, element in the city and you will quickly find yourselves a very well-used community center. But even having um, one lift in one washroom would be far beyond what is available in a lot of uh, community centers. Um, like, oh, go ahead. I just want to clarify, when you are talking about the lift, are you talking about the t adult change table or is it going to be tracking? It, 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 um, so the lift itself would be to assist someone to access the adult change table. And if it's a hydraulic adult change table that comes down in order to transfer from the wheelchair to... It depends on the individual, but you're gonna need, mo many people will need a lift to uh, assist with the transfer. Right. Thank you. Um, like many buildings, it looks like there's one elevator. Um, what is the plan for egress in uh, case the elevator is not functioning? Um, the, the exit stairs do have a little bit of a larger uh, landing platform. It's not, it's not quite to the level of the, um, you know, some, some standards are building in a kind of designated waiting space within the, within the exit stair. Um, we don't have that in, in, this, in this facility so far, um, but there is, it is a little bit of a wider uh, landing than, than is typical. Okay, something to think about because well-used community centers, often you'll find within a couple of years, mm -hmm. the elevators will be breaking down more than anticipated. Okay. Um, uh, two more quick questions. Um, the walking track on the roof, is that wheelchair accessible? Uh, yes. It, it will be we're working on a, on a level uh, a level access from the interior um, out to there. It will have a slight ramp to it, but uh, a five percent slope, so quite low slope. And uh, finally, the the temporary benches that are seasonal. Um, what is the plan for ensuring that those get put out and retrieved? Um, again, just noticing patterns over time with parks maintenance and and um, sometimes the best laid plans don't actually come to pass that way, so you may have the benches, but it, it, it may not happen. So is there any thinking around um, ensuring that those get put out and, and taken in when they're supposed to? It's something that we've discussed quite a bit with uh, the Parks Department, including their maintenance staff, so I, I believe everyone's on board for, for ensuring that that happens. Okay. We started to engage our operations staff early on uh, during the design uh, consultation to make sure all of them are aware of that, what temporary measure has to be done within the season and, and uh, skating trail uh, season. Okay. Well, thank you for that. It's a, it's a beautiful uh, rendering. Just to respond to your first question uh, about the drop-off zone, if you look at the, the plan here yeah. um, where it says drop-off pickup, that is a um, Wheeltrans exclusive uh, drop-off pickup zone. Okay, great. That is going to be um, curbless from the drop-off zone to the sidewalk, the adjacent sidewalk. And you, I'm assuming you'll have plans to integrate signage and wayfinding into that? Yes. Okay, thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Um, next member to question is Wendy. Hi, yeah. I'm in the West End, so I'm really thrilled to see that this is <laughs> happening. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to use it myself with my family. Um, I wanted to ask two questions. So one relates to the ice as well, uh, I think in terms of what Liv was asking about those benches. Is, is the whole of the skating trail flush with, the, with ground and are the benches only to be placed out in particular spaces? So what I'm, what I'm wondering about is how somebody who is uh, blind may be able to distinguish that they're going to step onto ice versus ground. So if it's flush and somebody's walking along there, uh, it's quite likely that somebody who has a visual disability would step onto the ice and not know it. So have you considered that in terms of your design? Um, so there will be a, because the ice builds up above the surface, it will be a little bit higher. Um, but the, the plan is to use the temporary uh, benches in winter uh, 
in those pathway zones where we where there would be a conflict. A lot of the skating trail is adjacent to gardens or planting. So in the, in the winter time, uh, people wouldn't be moving onto the skating trail from those areas. Um, is that clear? It is, but it, so my concern is that if there, the benches cannot, you know, kind of line up across the whole of the length of the skating trail, because benches or benches are gonna have spaces between them, right? And it, those instances of where there's a space and there's no bench beside it, and it's just a difference of height of what, like a couple of inches? It, you know, it could be a real hazard for somebody who's blind, that you're gonna step onto ice and not know it, and you're gonna fall and hurt yourself. So, mm -hmm. so I, you know, I, it's just a recommendation around the design piece of, the, of this particular part. I wanted to ask a second question around the playground. Um, so uh, can you talk to how a kiddo who uses a wheelchair would be able to use the playground? So in, in general, all of the, sorry, all of the, uh, the rooms are uh, infant, toddler, and preschool rooms have direct access out onto the, uh, onto the playground. And each, um, each area, the, the, so these guys are kind of divided, the preschool guys are divided from the toddlers. So, and then the infants as well have their own zones. So all the play features are um, geared to that age group and and they're they're kind of kept separate for that for that reason and within each within each zone um, once you're out there uh, the play features themselves are are designed for for everyone to be able to use so that was the the height of the sandboxes the elevated water table as well and then the other the other features in the middle um, the landscape team is still kind of working on them um, but I don't I think what we've been hearing from the uh, uh, Children's Services Department is that not not necessarily every single element is going to be applicable to applicable to everybody. Every, you know, some are kind of you know a log that you would walk on to develop your balancing skills and things like that. So there will be certain elements that um, that not everybody can use. But the idea is that there are zones and areas where different types of play uh, can take place. So it has to it has to kind of meet everybody's uh, uh, development needs. I guess is the they desire. Yeah, it does. Everybody's right. So, mm -hmm. um, is there are there any sort of elevated parts of the playground, and if so, are there ramps for kids to be able to get up them, or how how would that work? Is it like a ladder? I believe. I'm just trying to understand because, you know, kids playing together, mm -hmm. kids with disabilities playing with other kids is a really really important step forward. So I right. just wanted to know a little bit more. So in terms of the the elements that are elevated, I don't think that any of the play features are actually elevated. They're all on the ground. Um, some of them are, are similar to uh, what's at at St. James Park with the um, you know the, the the ice cream cone that looks uh, sort of looks like it's been spilled over. Then it has sort of the the mounds and things alongside of it. That's that's what this one in the middle kind of represents. Some of some of these elements, and then there are. Um, uh, panels that are mounted to the fence on the perimeter that are elevated that have um, chalkboards and, and different play features built into them. So I think that's that was what the the team was trying to do is provide a variety of different uh, uh, opportunities. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else uh, to ask questions? Okay. Seeing none, I just have probably one or two quick questions. I hope they're quick. Um, with respect to uh, creating a facility that is obviously uh, barrier free, that is looking to incorporate as much universal access as possible, um, has there been any conversation about the programming in the building to ensure that once you can get people in the building, they can actually use the programs that the city is offering? Mm -hmm. and, and has that happened with the community? Yes, it has for sure, and, and we have um, a, a TAC meeting, TAC with 1A in our, in our case, on every, uh, every other Thursday, and that includes uh, members of the, of the uh, program team who are working in the current Wallace Emerson facility. Um, so the needs that they have now and the things that they're seeing in the community, um, that's coming up in the, in the meetings every, um, every week, so that's been a, a big part of it. There was also a really um, robust public engagement that, that went along with us. I think we had, was it seven or eight public meetings or more um, on this, so really great feedback from, uh, from the community. 
That's fantastic. And, and with respect Sorry, if I can sorry. add, uh, we also had a focus group meetings specifically with the senior members of the community and uh, youth and, um, you know, women and different focus groups. Okay, great. Um, and are you familiar with the new skate trail at College Park? Have you gone yes. to see it? We have, we have been hearing quite a bit of that come up in the meetings with the operational team um, and, and kind of things that are working and things that are not working. And, and that's been a, an interesting yeah, uh, okay, profile great. to hear about. Yeah, no, thank you. I, I raised it only because I think we're, we're learning a few things about the new skate trail, which is also curbless. Um, and I, I, I wonder whether or not, um, not that it's too early to rule success or not. I think overall the design is, is quite good. Um, but whether or not um, the curbless skate trail, as it integrates with the, uh, the walking path, uh, whether or not it actually is um, the, the best path forward for accessibility, mm. uh, especially for those who probably need to see this, the surface change. Um, but as long as you're, you're already there you know, monitoring that outcome, it's, it's, it's great. Okay, okay thank you. Um, anyone else? No? Anyone to speak? Okay. Um, seeing none, I'll just uh, move to receive the, the presentation. You've uh, received uh, the comments of this committee. I want to thank you for the good work. I know it's not easy to build new recreation facilities, especially uh, one that is on a campus that's complicated and as comprehensive as this. Uh, I'm very excited for the community who lives around the neighborhood. I live downtown. I probably have chances of myself and my child uh, coming out to, is, uh, is, is, uh, is not going to be very frequent, but certainly we look forward to watching this being built because I know that uh, there's lots of folks in the community that would be very, very anxious to see it finished. So thank you. Great. Thank, thank you very so much. much. Okay. Uh, so we will now head back to item number four. Oh, sorry. I, I needed to actually have a vote on my motion to receive. All those in favor? Any opposed? That carries. Thank you. Thanks, Liv. Um, so we're moving back to item number four, folks. This is the, uh, this is the uh, item number three, I should say. This is the, uh, the, the matter that's entitled e-scooter oversight and management. We have our senior project manager, Janet Lowe, who's here to provide us with a presentation. What we'll do at this point, uh, particular point is we'll hear from, from Janet and then we'll open up the floor for deputations and we'll bring Janet back to uh, then ask questions of staff. Okay. Janet, when you're ready. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, sorry. So, uh, as the chair mentioned, my name is Janet Lowe. I'm a senior project manager in transportation services at the City of Toronto. Thanks for having me here today. The purpose of my presentation, sorry. sorry, we're just making sure that it, my presentation shows up on the screen. Great, thank you very much. Um, so with the title of my presentation up on the screen, it's on electric kick scooters. Um, as I was mentioning, the purpose of my presentation today is uh, threefold. The first is to um, inform the, uh, the TAC on recent provincial and city regulations on electric kick scooters. Uh, the second one is to explain the process that's underway to develop a report on e-scooters for city council. And the, the key goal today is to get your input and comments. Uh, just to be um, sort of clear on the scope of the report and the presentation, on this slide it shows an image of an electric kick scooter, which I'll keep calling e-scooters. Um, basically it's a device in the photo that looks like a long skateboard with uh, two wheels at each end. The wheels are typically 8 to 10 inches in diameter. Uh, it has a handle stick that the rider uh, uses to hold as they're standing on the um, e-scooter to, to operate it. Um, the, um, it's powered by battery. It can travel at a speed of about 24 kilometers per hour using a throttle. Um, on the market, you can purchase and privately own one that can go actually up to 52 miles per hour. Um, and um, there's also the popularity of it, which is enabled by mobile apps that allow the rental and sharing of e-scooters. 
the, these devices um, are gaining in popularity for several reasons. Uh, people find them fun, convenient, you don't need to sweat, you can go farther distances than you could by foot. Um, they're often cheaper than a ride hail, more easy to find. Um, you don't have to wait for a ride hail, like a Uber or a Lyft or a taxi. Um, there are no immediate greenhouse gas emissions with this, since it's battery operated and it's electric. Um, they're easy to use, uh, so you simply stand on them, and um, you, uh, as I mentioned, the mobile apps enable the um, easy rental of them. So on my next slide, there are two uh, images. Uh, one image is from Kelowna on the left. It shows a row of about 16 e-scooters that are uh, lined up on a boardwalk. Um, the image on the right-hand side is a photograph of an on-street um, parking spot for e-scooters. It's about the size of a car uh, parking spot. It's delineated with white paint, symbols, uh, showing that it's for e-scooter parking, and there's some bollards that are spaced at about a meter apart um, along the perimeter. So what um, is sort of the impetus of the report to council um, is not only sort of the rise of this new uh, vehicle type, but the Ontario regulation number 389, um, forward slash 19 a pilot project for electric kick scooters. Essentially, this was, uh, it was released late last year. It took effect January 1st. Um, it sets a five-year pilot period for municipalities uh, to have the choice to opt in to test e-scooters. Uh, this does require municipalities to change their bylaws. So currently, they're not allowed until a municipality um, changes their bylaws to permit um, where these e-scooters can be operated. On public roads, bike lanes, cycle tracks, trails, paths, parks, uh, on sidewalks, walkways, or in public squares, or, or um, um, I think uh, um, event grounds. Uh, they're not to be operated on controlled access highways or highways where pedestrians and bicycles are prohibited. I won't, um, it's, uh, I won't go through the entire re regulation, but I'll, I'll provide some key highlights. On this slide, there's an image of a um, e-scooter rider uh, operating an e-scooter in a roadway. So the key highlights are that the maximum speed under the Highway Traffic Act regulation is 24 kilometers per hour. Um, it can't have a seat or pedals or a basket, uh, can't carry cargo, and it can't have an enclosure. Um, the minimum age to operate one is 16. Um, if you're under 18, you must wear a helmet. Um, there's no uh, vehicle permit required, no driver's license, and it's treated much like a bicycle or cyclist. Um, so you must use a bicycle lane where they are provided, um, and where there aren't bicycle lanes, you um, need to ride as close to the right on, or on the shoulder. Uh, in terms of operating the e-scooter, um, one must keep a safe distance uh, away and give way to pedestrians and cyclists um, where there isn't enough speed to pass or space to pass. Um, one shouldn't operate at a speed markedly greater than pedestrians when near them. Uh, one should use a bell or horn um, and also lights are needed. And one mustn't harm, injure or damage directly or indirectly any person or property. Uh, it's a one-person device, uh, can't carry or tow anyone else or anything else. Um, one must not leave the device um, in the intended path of pedestrians. Uh, any accidents involving a pedestrian animal or vehicle needs to be reported. Police are required to submit reports to the, the Ministry of Transportation. Um, and municipalities are required to remit data on the pilot projects to the province. So in order to um, implement the regulation, there are still some tools that are needed. Um, some of the key tools uh, that the police use to report incidences, it's an electronic template called the Motor Vehicle Accident Template. Um, there is no category or field for e-scooters. Uh, we've been asking the province to include that. Um, we're working with public 
Health, the Toronto Public Health is here with me today, uh, with Public Health Ontario. Uh, we're looking at a way in which we can collect injury um, and hospital data. Um, the, some of the other items that uh, we are looking into is the questions about insurance. Um, you know, whether there are insurance products available uh, for, for e-scooter riders, um, as well as adequate insurance and liability. Um, in terms of minimum, minimum maintenance standards, I'm not sure if many of you are aware, but the province actually sets those for municipalities um, in terms of the, up, the level of upkeep for infrastructure. Uh, however, for roads and sidewalks, they were based obviously on, on previous modes um, and not these new devices. I'd like to emphasize that uh, the city recognizes the opportunities with new mobility options, and what we're trying to do is figure out how best um, to develop and implement policy and programs um, to, uh, to support new mobility options. The current state in Toronto, however, is that um, e-scooters are not permitted um, currently for use or operation on, on public uh, the public right of way, so not roads, bike lanes, cycle tracks, trails, paths, parks, sidewalk, walkways, or public squares. Uh, last October in 2019, City Council prohibited parking, storing, and leaving e-scooters on any street, sidewalk, or pedestrian way. That's typically how uh, shared e-scooter rental programs work, is they're dockless and they're left on sidewalks for people to easily find them, use them, and leave them for the next person to use their mobile app to rent. Um, uh, in October, Council asked for a report on how we would approach e-scooter oversight and management. Um, and we have a report that's currently slated for March 11th Infrastructure and Environment Committee. I'd like to note that only bicycles or e-bikes that have pedals are allowed in Toronto's bike facilities. Uh, what's guiding our decision making are six key policy areas. Uh, the first one, which is a priority for the city, is Vision Zero, uh, road safety, focusing on vulnerable road users, uh, pedestrians, seniors, and children. Uh, the second one is about ensuring uh, improved mobility options uh, that are greener and more space efficient. The third is about social equity and inclusion. Um, we, we spoke about the poverty reduction strategy earlier. Um, the fourth is about sustainability and resiliency and adaptability. Um, the last two are about the fact that the city is growing rapidly. Uh, we want to protect for uh, the city's vitality, but also be responsible in how we make use of resources and innovation and collaboration. In terms of stakeholder feedback so far, um, I want to make sure that I give the committee time to provide uh, your input and comments. We have heard from a range of stakeholders, from persons um, with disability groups, um, accessibility, uh, those who are concerned about accessibility, um, pedestrian advocates. Uh, we've met uh, with the Business Improvement Areas Association, um, cycling groups, environmental groups. Uh, we've met with our transit partners. Um, and some of the key highlights are um, uh, numerous uh, concerns from those with um, who, those who are concerned about the sidewalk and um, potential friction and trip hazards on sidewalks. The, um, the 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 fact that you can't quite hear these electric devices uh, that are quite quiet. Our business improvement areas are very concerned about the space management issue, but I'll also highlight that they're concerned about intoxicated riding. Um, in some jurisdictions, what they've done is they have a curfew. Uh, so at 10 p.m. or midnight or 2 a.m., whatever is chosen, e-scooters have to be either locked so they can't be used or removed from the streets. Um, the a number of cycling groups are very interested in particular that this would um, add to the constituency to support um, the build out of the cycle network. Uh, transit partners see this as a way for first and last mile options to get to transit stops and stations. Um, and in terms of our environmental stakeholders, uh, as I said, there are no immediate emissions from this device, um, but there are um, some life cycle questions. 
Oh, actually, one other thing I'll mention is a number of the business improvement areas are uh, interested in what's called geofencing. Geofencing is the use of geospace, um, sorry, the sort of satellite data connected to the vehicles to sort of say where they can go or can't go. Um, because of our, our built form and some of the taller buildings, uh, the accuracy of geofencing is limited. Uh, so I just wanted to temper some of the expectations on, it's a useful tool, a lot of jurisdictions use it, um, but a number of the BAs want to geofence specific areas and, and the accuracy of that um, uh, uh, may be less than uh, perfect. The next section that I'll go through is on the proposed options that we're looking at, um, having looked at other cities. Uh, one of the more recent um, Canadian examples, um, as opposed to just the US ones, is the city of Calgary. Um, they ran their pilot approximately from uh, July to end of October. Um, they did allow e-scooters on sidewalks and pathways and bike lanes. They were prohibited from use in the roadway. The maximum speed is lower than in Ontario by four kilometers. Uh, they had a fleet that they started out with, which was about 1,500. There were two operators. Um, E-scooter users found them beneficial for trips, for errands, work trips, dining or shopping and recreation. Um, based on post-survey data, one out of three trips reduced a car trip, whether it was a ride hill or a personal car trip. 55% um, would have walked. Uh, the average trip length varies. Um, it's, it was actually in um, 0 0.9 kilometers. However, if you look at the length of time that users used it, it might be closer to 1.2 kilometers per trip. There were 677 emergency room visits in the end. 33 of them required ambulance transport to the hospital. One of those that was transported by ambulance was a pedestrian. Uh, the complaint breakdown for the 311 system included about 40% about sidewalk riding, um, just under a third about undesirable behaviors, and about 20% about parking issues. Um, the proposed improvement, improvements to the program uh, include uh, proposing some designated parking areas, some slowdown zones where there's high pedestrian activity and slowing it down to, let's say, 10 kilometers per hour, fines uh, for sidewalk, um, collisions or um, reckless behavior. In terms of other jurisdictions, each city really is different in terms of context. Uh, some of our large peer cities uh, don't yet have e-scooters, uh, such as London, UK, New York City, Sydney, Australia, just to name a few. Um, Chicago is in the process of evaluating their data. Just at the end of last week, they published their 99-page evaluation report. Um, I think I'm just going to highlight the things that this particular committee would be most interested in. They had 10 pedestrian ER incidences over four months. Uh, that's about 5% of the ER incidents. Their fleet was uh, over 2,000. In San Francisco, um, they, had, they started out small. Um, they had two operators. Um, what they learned was that there were um, complaints about obstructions on sidewalks as well as theft and vandalism. So they're requiring what's called a lock two system, which is essentially how bicycles are locked. You use a bike lock to lock it to a bike ring or some other place, um, so they're not dockless. Um, a number of jurisdictions are moving towards that in terms of having designated parking areas. Um, Montreal, their report was supposed to be last week, but they've delayed it for another month, but they had uh, a much more limited pilot. It was about a third the size of what uh, was in Calgary. Quebec is different. Helmets are required for all riders, not just those that are under 18. Um, in Mo Montreal, their governance system is different. Of the 19 boroughs, only four of the boroughs voted to or, or opted into pilot. In Paris and Singapore, they previously allowed riding on sidewalks and footpaths and the like, but they have since banned them. Um, and in San Diego, they used to have it on, allow e-scooters on their boardwalk, uh, but from a number of conflicts on boardwalks, they have now banned it from the boardwalk. In some places like Tel Aviv and Malta, they now require helmets as well as license plates and mandatory insurance, I believe. So um, at the, on the spectrum of options uh, that we're considering, although we're moving towards a preferred option, um, at one end is um, sort of the 
the bands and the temporary, the temporary bands. Um, so this would be to sort of uh, wait it out and look for improved uh, or to actually have industry standards because there are they're none currently. Um, there isn't an international standard or Canadian standard for these devices. Uh, to sort of wait for further comprehensive data uh, from other evaluations um, to essentially not be first out the gate. Um, some jurisdictions that have outright sort of banned them are Boulder, Colorado most recently, um, Sydney, Australia, Houston, Honolulu, and the others that I mentioned that don't currently have e-scooters. Our preferred option uh, that we've um, been sharing with a number of the stakeholders that I, I showed on the other slide um, is to um, consider all the, the issues that we've heard before um, and to proactively manage them through making the Toronto Parking Authority's bike share program the umbrella for all things that are shared micromobility. So small personal transportation devices. So um, bike share is adding 300 e -bike, e bikes to their shared system because as I mentioned, it enables people to travel longer distances and to, um, uh, to be able to uh, not, uh, manage changes in elevation. So the high density of uh, bike share stations, uh, they're planning for 625, makes it easy for people to be able to walk to them and access um, these shared micromobility options. Uh, this enables, sorry, this addresses the sidewalk clutter and obstructions issue. Um, the potential for converting on-street parking is something that Toronto Parking Authority has that, um, that advantage. Um, there's a transit integration opportunity. <laughs> bike share is working with a number of our transit partners to add bike share um, to where there's transit. Um, and uh, Janet, if I can just ask you to sure. perhaps pick up the pace of your sorry, presentation. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, we're heading into almost 20 minutes. For, okay, yeah. sorry, the, the next one is an open permit system. For a number of reasons, we don't think this is as, as preferred. Um, essentially under the City of Toronto Act, we don't have the authority to limit the number of operators users or users, sorry, limit the number of e-scooter operators or the fleet size or even the geographic area. That is a significant concern. We have had about 12 to 15 companies express interest. Um, we think that's probably not an optimal approach. Um, the, we continue to gather information on best practices um, in terms of safety improvements, service, service standards, enforcement, um, equity and infrastructure opportunities. Um, my name and contact information is on this slide. It's janet.lo at toronto.ca. Um, as mentioned, we're slated for March 11th Infrastructure and Environment Committee. Um, regarding other micromobility devices, we have been asked to look at e-cargo, uh, e-bikes, and mobility assisted devices. This umbrella framework for micromobility um, is slated for either Q4 or possibly early 2021. Great. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, and thank you for that very detailed presentation. Uh, we're going to move to just hear from uh, deputants. Uh, our first deputant should be Peter Anthonapsopoulos from the Spinal Cord Injury of Ontario. Uh, but because we, yes, nice to see you. Uh, because uh, David was timed, David uh, Lepofsky was timed for 11.30, would you mind if we actually heard from David first? So just take me a, a few seconds to try to cue him on the, on the phone. So we're gonna switch you with David, okay? Um, so let's try that. And everyone, please bear with us. Janet, don't go too far, because you know you're gonna come back and answer some questions for us. Hi, David. Uh, this is Kristen yes. Wong Tam. How are you doing? I am great. How are you? Good. Thank you, David. We have you on speakerphone. Uh, you are actually um, uh, speaking to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. We just, by way of your information, for your information, we just heard uh, the presentation from staff on the e-scooters, uh, and uh, you have five minutes if you would like to make your deputation over the phone. Are you ready? Fantastic. Okay. Okay. And let me be. 
begin by thanking you all very much, both for the opportunity to present and for your giving me the opportunity to do so by phone, because I'm between teaching two courses at two different ends of the city. Uh, I'd much rather have been there in person. Let me uh, also thank you for taking time to look into the electric scooter issue. Um, I trust that you will have received a copy of the open letter which the AODA Alliance has sent the province, the mayor, and all city councilors uh, has made available to the uh, mayors and, and councilors of all uh, municipalities around Ontario. Um, has that been circulated? Can I just ask so I know if you've uh, seen yes. it yet or not seen Yes, it? David, uh, it has been. It has been, fantastic. All right. We're, um, we aim to make sure that all councillors and mayors get to see it around the province. Um, the bottom line, electric scooters pose an immediate and serious danger to people with disabilities, as well as others. They should not be allowed. We ask your committee, the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee, to make a strong recommendation to the mayor and the Council of Toronto to not permit them in Toronto at all. If they are to be considered at all, and they shouldn't be, there should be very serious restrictions placed on their use. Let me describe the dangers. Let me make the suggestions. Uh, these are all covered for open letter. Uh, by way of background, as some of you may know, the Accessibility for Appearance of the Disabilities Act Alliance, which I chair, is a nonpartisan coalition which has led the fight for the past 15 years to get our accessibility legislation uh, implemented with the successor to the coalition that fought for a decade to get the AODA passed, uh, which your committee owes its uh, mandate to. Uh, we, uh, as part of this, we have been in a leadership role since last August when we first learned about this e-scooters issue in campaigning to get them stopped or restricted. Uh, before the province uh, even got started. Unfortunately, the Ford government has essentially disregarded virtually everything we've said uh, and has simply listened to the lobbyists for the e-scooter rental companies. Why do e-scooters scooters pose a danger to people with disabilities? These are dangers which the e-scooter rental companies, the corporate lobbyists lobbying for this, have not disproven publicly uh, at all. The first is uh, that uh, the very funding model for them, or business model for them, that the e-scooter rental companies use in other cities, is that they are left all over the city, not in racks, but on sidewalks or other public places. And they need to be left all over the city uh, and concentrated in uh, as many places as they can. So that uh, a member of the public who wants one can tap on an app, find the nearest one, and rely that they're on the fact that there'll be one nearby so they can ride them to their destination. They are essentially seeking free parking at the taxpayer's expense. But beyond that, for people with disabilities, an e-scooter lying on the sidewalk is a huge tripping hazard for someone like me who is blind and can be a complete obstacle to travel, to accessible travel, uh, for somebody using a mobility device. If the sidewalk they want to walk, they want to walk on with their wheelchair or walker or, or, or whatever be their mobility device, uh, is an accessible route of travel, and all of a sudden there's an e-scooter blocking it, it's become a completely inaccessible route of travel. The, so their entire business model involves creating new barriers against us. The second serious uh, problem that these pose, and there's ample experience for other municipalities where these have been allowed, uh, is the, the risk of being injured by them. An e-scooter whipping at you silently, because they are silent, at up to 24 kilometers an hour by a driver who is, does not have to have a helmet, they're over 17, is not, does not have to have any insurance, does not have to have a driver's license, does not have to have any training at all. Uh, whipping along at that speed is a danger, and they do cause injuries, they will cause injuries. We're all vulnerable to this, but as one uh, uh, letter to the editor pointed out, particularly for seniors, one impact for them sending them flying uh, could end up being even more serious than for the rest of us. Uh, and as a blind individual, I won't see them coming, I won't hear them coming, they're a serious danger. Therefore, we say, don't allow them at all. And you're the Disability Advisory Committee, you're in the strongest position to give that advice. Now then, if 
we don't get listened to because the corporate lobbyists who have the inside track with Queen's Park and no doubt are already lobbying city councilors, or at least some of them uh, now, uh, behind closed doors. Uh, we then say, put strong restrictions on them. The province has not. The province is allowing them to be permitted on sidewalks. The province is leaving it to municipalities to enforce uh, regulations on them, and the regulations are paltry and inadequate. We say to the municipalities, to the extent you can, impose restrictions on their use. Okay, Don't allow them on sidewalks. Require insurance. Require a driver's license. Don't allow, require them to be uh, parked in a rack. In fact, don't let rental at all. Don't allow rental at all. If people want to buy them, that's one thing. David. But don't allow for this rental bottle. David, uh, sorry, our, this, this, yes. this is Kristen again, the chair. Um, the, your, your time for the deputation is up. There may be some, perhaps some questions from the members uh, who want to clarify your, your comments. Uh, if you sure, just, absolutely. If you just want to take a, a pause, uh, let me just open the floor to uh, members of the committee if they have any questions for our speaker. Okay. Uh, thank you. Seeing none, okay. Uh, David, thank you very much for your deputation. We do also have your communication on record, uh, and I recognize that it is very full. It's several pages long. Uh, we're going to um, jump off the phone with you. I'm going to bring it back into our committee and hear from our next speaker who's actually uh, ready to present. If there are any questions that people have in the follow-up, just email us at aodaalliance.org. Thanks very much for including us. Okay, thank you, David. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Um, our next speaker, thank you, uh, is Peter. Peter, thanks a lot for helping us uh, vary that uh, order. Uh, when you're ready, you've got five minutes, you can begin. Great. Um, hi, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to speak today about e uh, regarding e-scooters. Um, I'm going to be very short because David pretty much encompassed um, the majority of our, uh, of our recommendations here today. But I will mention on behalf of Spinal Cord Injury Ontario, and our membership of 43,000 individuals across Ontario, mainly living with spinal cord injuries in Toronto. We fully support the AODA Alliance recommendations to eliminate e-scooters to be regulated in this, in this city. Um, we have seen firsthand through our counterpart organizations across the country and internationally um, from disability organizations in the States and in Europe that these e-scooter rentals have been a complete disaster to people with disabilities. I just recently um, was in Cleveland, Ohio, um, where these uh, e-scooters are regulated and um, I, I've seen these things thrown on the streets and cars have to be diverted. I've seen these things just laid on um, sidewalks. Um, all these regulations have been put in place for these e-scooters to make them sound safety, safe and secure. But the reality is um, human nature will, may not um, allow people, will not possibly listen to some of the regulations and just create harm to people. Um, I know in other districts that I've seen, they've prevented them from the sidewalks. They've um, um, asked for them to be in bike lane um, securements. Um, but those have never been the case, and all we've seen is higher risks of incidents of people getting hurt. And um, and this recreational device um, is great in parks in other regions, but it shouldn't be a commuting device. And I don't think I need to go any further because um, we've written a submission, um, we've endorsed the AODA Alliance, and um, we wish that this count, um, this committee takes a very strong stance to council to eliminate the. Or, or not entertain any further e-scooters as a rental in this in this city. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Are there any questions uh, for Peter? Uh, Peter, before you go away, so the recommendation that that your that the alliance as well as uh, your organization has for this particular body is to prohibit e-scooter rentals or e-scooter use altogether. Rentals. The the. the uh, yeah, that's very good that I make that clear. The, the whole notion of for-profit companies coming into the city and renting and allowing people to rent these things as um, commuting devices, which in our minds, we believe they're recreational devices, not commuting devices. And for the, just, uh, just to play the devil's advocate, because I know that there are um, uh, colleagues I have on, on city council who are very keen to see alternative uh, energy sourced vehicles, including e-scooters, uh, become more commonplace. Uh, they see it as a viable uh, source of, uh, of transportation. 
a mode of transportation and in, in light of the climate change emergency. How would you respond to that particular argument? Well, I think we need to look at just alternative different um, things. We already have bikes uh, and we're all more set up in this city with bike lanes and looking at innovation around using e-bikes um, that are safer, less control, uh, more controlled. We have an environment in this in, in, on the roads to be able to use them. They're already um, contained within a locking mechanisms in different parts of the city. We already have infrastructure in place that will uh, that we can further expand in this space. It's just the liabilities of a very quiet, small, uh, fast at 24 kilometers, driving in and out of the, the sidewalks and left abandoned um, wherever people please is just doesn't sound like a good solution to improving e-transportation um, in this city. And obviously, I mean, those companies are, they're, they're here in the room, they're observing our, our proceedings uh, probably through, uh, through the online uh, caption. Uh, if they were to make those accommodations to address the concerns that people with disabilities have, uh, would that be sufficient? Well, I, we're open to hearing new ideas and ways in which people can make this a safer product. At this point, from what we've seen today, from the provincial regulation to what other municipalities have been doing, um, as a membership of Spinal Cord Injury Ontario, we're not satisfied. Um, and that's why we also support the AODA Alliance um, recommendation in their open letter as well, because we have not seen the detail uh, and due diligence and the responsibility um, for, for, for people that, that could possibly get injured or create a new perpetuating barrier right. uh, to people with disabilities. So, so what I surmise from your presentation is not now, because the, the companies haven't thought out all the other public safety concerns, uh, but you'd be, you'd be willing to revisit the issue uh, if those concerns were adequately addressed. Is that as a, what as, a, as a membership-driven organization, we would take information back. We would um, deliberate with our with our membership in Toronto and, and provide recommendation again. At this point today, people with disabilities that are part of the membership of Spinal Cord Injury Ontario have reviewed the information and are not satisfied and do not feel safe to have these these e-scooters available in Toronto at this time. Okay, thank you very much. Um, anyone else to ask questions? Seeing none, you're off the hot seat. Thanks, Peter, for your, for your comments. Uh, Janet, uh, would you mind coming back to answer questions for the staff? Okay. So Janet delivered almost nearly a 20-minute presentation. She may have captured everything you possibly want to know about e-scooters and the, the upcoming um, uh, legislative requirements that she's got to consider. Um, open up the, uh, the floor to questions from, uh, from members. Any members to question? Uh, yes, go ahead, please. Howard. Uh, <clears throat> I'm concerned about the safety aspect of these e-scooters in terms of lack of visibility from the persons on the road or walking on the sidewalk. Um, there's no reflectors or lights or anything of that type on these uh, mobility devices. Uh, how is that being addressed? Um, uh, thanks for your question. So in the Ontario regulation, they do require lights to be on the device, uh, but they do say that it's more about um, sort of sunset and sunrise times when it's darker. Um, but it sounds like from what, what you're asking about, it's more like in general as well in terms of the um, the visibility. So as I mentioned, there are about 15 different companies that have different products. Uh, they're different colors. Uh, some, some of the companies have designed them so that they are a bit they're, they're chosen the, um, the look of it to make them more visible. Um, but from what we understand, the visibility issue in terms of safety is for the e-scooter rider themselves in terms of trucks or cars uh, seeing them. Is that the end of your question? Okay. Anyone else? Liv, please. Hi, thank you for your report. Uh, it's a lot to consider. Um, I have been in uh, visiting in other jurisdictions that have e-bikes, uh, no, sorry, e-scooters, pardon me. And um, my question is about um, this sort of uh, litter of bikes that, that tends to happen, sorry, scooters that tends to happen. So 
I saw scooters left in bike lanes just sitting there. I saw them blocking curb cuts. I saw them in bus shelters. Um, I was waiting for a bus with an elderly uh, woman who wasn't able to sit uh, without someone moving the scooters away. Um, so obviously, I think it's a real uh, question of creating new barriers. And I'm wondering, um, I know you went through many different jurisdictions and the many, what, what um, from what you have seen of the existing research, what is the best method, uh, short of not having e-scooters, which may, may in fact be the best, but what is the best method for dealing with this uh, tendency of people to just strew them everywhere? Uh, that's an excellent question, and it's a theme that comes up across all the jurisdictions. Um, I, was, I would say it's still early days. Um, so San Francisco was just beginning to test what's called a lock two system, uh, because they did find that if, um, if there wasn't a locking mechanism from the scooter to um, like bike parking, uh, that they would be stolen or uh, they would be used to vandalize something or they'd be vandalism to the e-scooter. Um, we, we don't know how well Lock 2 is working. Some of the criticisms of Lock 2 is that then you can't easily remove them if they're in, a, in the wrong place. Um, in fact, if they are creating an obstacle. Um, uh, some of the companies um, are developing uh, docked stations, so you can essentially, like the the bike share system, you're uh, physically um, connecting it to something where you can potentially also recharge it. Um, what we are suggesting uh, is the designated parking model, which a lot of jurisdictions are moving to. So Montreal and um, I think Santa Monica, they had, uh, in the image that I showed, they had painted out uh, a parking spot and put, the reason why um, bollards are important is sometimes cars actually drive over the parking spot where e-scooters are supposed to be. So having some protection for where the e-scooters should be parked um, is important. Th uh, there's also what I mentioned is geofencing, which is sort of an electronic way to designate an area. Because of the inaccuracy and imperfections of geofencing, it's not the greatest mechanism for, for requiring where something should be parked. Because if the signal is not uh, working out, um, an e-scooter rider may be trying to return it to the parking, but the signal doesn't allow them to actually put it where it should belong. And then sometimes there's a penalty for parking it in the wrong spot. And so there are a number of things that are still being worked out. Um, we're looking at all the best practices, and that's why we're recommending that the Toronto Parking Authority be our model, we would we would use it in that manner to to try and have a more order, orderly approach to e-scooter parking. Thank you. Um, another question, just about the size and scope of the pilot. If I understand correctly, we're looking at a four-year pilot with seven thousand of uh, of these e-scooters. Is that correct? Uh, no, we actually haven't spoken about uh, the fleet size or or the number of operators. Um, and the it's sorry, it's a five year pilot frame for under the um, the the province of Ontario. So uh, 2020 up to the year 2024. Um, the uh, the pilots have ranged in size. As I mentioned, uh, Montreal went really small. There are only about 600 e-scooters. Uh, Chicago started out with about 2,500. Uh, Paris was up to like over 20,000. Um, one of the companies has published a ratio that they think is a good target ultimately for um, providing the service, which is one to 1,000 residents, which would mean 30,000 in Toronto. Obviously, that wouldn't be what it started out at. Um, a number of jurisdictions have suggested that an, a very incremental approach is a good approach. Thank you for clarifying that. Okay, thank you very much, Liv. Uh, next person to question is Wendy. Hi there, thank you for the presentation. Um, I have three questions. Uh, the first one relates to what we know about the people who have been injured in their interactions with e-scooters. So uh, 677 is a huge number, and that definitely caught my attention. And I wonder if you could speak to, uh, you know, who were they that were injured? What were the circumstances? Is there any more information that you could provide on that? So that's my first question. Um, my second question is uh, related to enforcement, and I, I realize you have not necessarily answered this yet, but who, who would be responsible for enforcing things like slowing down near pedestrians and uh, you know, not being drunk while you're using it? Um, 
And thirdly, I'm not entirely clear from your presentation on where we stand in terms of recommendations from the City of Toronto at this point. I understand that we're still kind of collecting those, but it's a complete blank slate for me in terms of what you think is going to come out of the report that's going to be um, presented to Council. So what are the kinds of recommendations that the City is currently considering in terms of uh, e-scooters? Ah, great. So I'll start with the first one. Um, on the injuries and interactions, um, I'll, I'll give you some broad strokes. So some of the um, sort of seminal reports, one is the Centers for Disease Control. They worked with the City of Austin's public health. Um, they found that, um, and there, there were other ones from uh, UCLA Medical Center and the like. The, the majority, in the majority of cases, 80% of e-scooter riders are actually um, hurt themselves, uh, they're falling off the e-scooters or losing control. Um, the f around half of them have head injuries or facial injuries. Um, in roughly uh, 11 to 16 percent of the time, uh, they're colliding with either a vehicle or an object. Um, as I mentioned in Chicago, it was about 5 percent that was involved a pedestrian. In the city of Calgary's example, um, uh, it was directly from uh, Dr. Eddie Lang, the uh, head of emergency uh, room research at Alberta Health Services, uh, that I got the information about 677 total um, emergency room incidences. Uh, he's, he's working on uh, looking at the studies. The only broad strokes that I have are that about 116 of them uh, were head and facial, and 164 were, um, I think, fract fractures of the upper or lower body. But the, the severity of them, we don't have that information. The information that was in the Calgary staff report was that there were 33 that required ambulance transport to the hospital. Um, so, your, so your second um, question about enforcement uh, is, is one that we're still working through, um, like as I mentioned, the, some of the mechanisms under the, the provincial regulation isn't even available. So police reporting of incidences, we need a mechanism. Uh, the set fines for the offenses hasn't been issued, so we don't even know what the chart, the, the, fi the fine amount is under the reg. Um, I'll say that from other jurisdictions, this is the most challenging issue. Um, some have even called it kind of unenforceable. Um, if someone is on the sidewalk, we don't necessarily have the capacity to um, monitor, chase down people. Um, police, police are very busy. Uh, this is this is something that would be additional. Um, in terms of inebriation, though, some of the companies are looking at an app where you have to do some cognitive testing before you can, you know unlock one and use it. Uh, apparently that's been proven to be effective. Uh, some jurisdictions have required them to be removed overnight. Uh, there's criticisms of that as well. One is that sometimes that's when people really need options because transit isn't as available. Um, it is, um, in terms of compliance and in terms of labor intensive, that's for the companies, that's, that's also something. It's enforcement, it's, it's, going to be a, it's going to be a big challenge and it's going to require resources. Sorry, your last one is on the recommendations in the report. Uh, we don't want to preclude what's in it because we want to complete um, these kinds of consultations. Uh, we are aware um, of the, the very polarizing issue in a lot of jurisdictions. They said people either love them or either hate them. So we haven't done an open public survey. What we've done is we're doing a randomized survey of 1,000 Toronto Torontonians through, through a poll, uh, through a polling company. Uh, we're doing focus groups. Um, we are also doing direct uh, stakeholder um, surveys where the email is specific to the organization. Uh, we don't want anything sort of necessarily um, influenced from the outside. And the, the other piece is is essentially, I think what I've alluded to is that we're, we're proposing the Toronto Parking Authority as the umbrella for all shared micromobility. We need direction from council on, on that step, and then we would proceed with, um, or not, if, that's, if, that's what, if, they, if they have a different um, decision, then it, we would need to proceed in looking at the, the other path. So that's essentially um, the key point of what the report back would be. Sorry, you actually run out of time. Um, let's extend it so you can fit your final question in. 
Thank you. Just one quick question. So in terms of all of those consultation methods that you've outlined, how are you ensuring that people with disabilities are being included? Uh, uh, directly, we have, um, I can share the list, we have directly reached out to accessibility stakeholder organizations like the um, Spinal Cord Injury uh, Group, Ontario Group. Yes. Uh, thank you. Any other members for questions? Okay. So, um, maybe I'll just quickly ask a question regarding timeline. Um, recognizing that there's this big band of, of time permitted, it's a five-year project. Um, every municipality and, and, and local order of government is supposed to now just respond to, to the government of Ontario opening the DORA. Um, if Toronto um, is not the first one out of the gate with, its, uh, with new regulations and a new bylaw, um, what's the impact of our adjacent, um, uh, adjacent cities and municipalities uh, and how these e-scooters come into the city? Because they're obviously using it to, to commute. What's permitted in Mississauga may not be permitted in Toronto. How do we reconcile that? Uh, so we actually have had an informal network of municipalities sort of working together and sharing information. Um, at this time, we're co actually we're speaking with Mississauga very frequently. Um, they are working on an overarching micromobility strategy. Essentially, we're coordinated. We're coordinating with all of our neighbors, um, with York, Durham, Peel, uh, with Vaughan, Mississauga, and the like, Brampton. So um, I can't preclude where they're all going. A number of municipalities are are sort of doing a wait and see. Um, I would say that none of the, um, out of the GTA ones, GTA ones, there aren't any that I'm aware of that are, are proceeding quickly. Uh, the ones that are pr proceeding quickly that I know of are Windsor, um, possibly Hamilton. Um, City of London is looking at a similar model that we are, where the bike share is sort of being combined with, with other micromobility opportunities. Um, possibly Ottawa. And with respect to the pilot project that was implemented in Calgary, I recognize that it was really just about four months, four and a half months. Um, during those four and a half months, your reports um, outlines that they had 677 ER visits. Um, and you said that one of those, um, one of those visits uh, was, a, was involving a pedestrian, someone who's not using an e-scooter. Does that mean the 676 of those ER visits were just people falling off the ER scooter or not knowing how to operate them? Uh, no. One out of the 33 that required ambulance transport to the ER. One out of 33 was oh, a pedestrian. So, so, so then... We don't have a breakdown of the 677. I see. And how... I mean, I know the ERs in Toronto are relatively full, especially the... the I mean, there's, there's never a time where you can walk through the door and just get seen quickly unless you are in life-critical, um, uh, dire situation. Has the Ontario Health... Um, I mean, I know that Toronto Public Health is here, but uh, chances are you're not going to... Toronto Public Health is not going to be the, at, at the line of triage. It's actually the hospitals and the ER, ERs that are going to be in, the, in that particular line of fire. Uh, how are they involved with this discussion? The, the doctors and the nurses working and, and the paramedics working in the ERs? I'll, I'll start, and if Toronto Public Health has additional... Um, we are working closely with Toronto Public Health on um, sort of commissioning a study uh, that would partner with a number of the trauma centres and hospitals, um, and Toronto Public Health is assisting us with reaching out to Toronto Paramedic Services. I'll let Lauren... Hi, Lauren Vanderlinden. Um, so we are engaging with Public Health Ontario. They have an injury prevention specialist there. They are working with their colleagues in hospitals and ER departments, and there's an injury prevention uh, network and a trauma registry that they are sort of trying to coordinate to uh, look at this, because Public Health Ontario does have a role to uh, provide technical support to public health units across Ontario. So they are going to be in a leadership role and likely uh, strong collaborators and advisors on our, our pilot uh, health study. Have you ever seen a situation where hospitals and, and those in professional health care just say no? Based on the overwhelming statistics, the, the risk to public safety, um, ha has there ever been a situation they just said, it's a bad idea, don't do it? Um, I. 
well, I'm not sure in the in the instance. Of, you mean in terms of gathering data or saying no to a particular measure? I guess we'll. I guess we'll. Will the health professionals in the health system um, will they take an active position, a stated position on e-scooters? If we are seeing 677 ER visits just alone in the city of Calgary over a four-month period, um, so. Uh, what we're seeing from other jurisdictions is there are some doctors that have been speaking out. So in uh, Berlin, Detroit, Minneapolis, um, in, um, sorry, I'm blanking from, from the last, uh, in Auckland, New Zealand in particular. Um, in Calgary, I think the, the sentiment is that there are policy interventions that need to um, improve. Mind you, Calgary allows sidewalk riding. I think they believe that helmet helmet use could um, reduce some of the impacts, but as I mentioned, that doesn't affect the facial uh, injuries necessarily. Okay. Um, and so what's your timeline on the report? So we are slated for March 11th Infrastructure and Environment Committee, and the agenda gets posted okay. five days before, so it's people all can look for the report and then submit uh, written or, or ask to make a deputation. Thank you very much. Okay, anyone else to question? Moving into speakers? Okay, uh, anyone to speak? Wendy, go ahead. Um, I, I have very, very serious concerns about the use of e-scooters on sidewalks in Toronto. So not even just the rental, of, but the use of them on the sidewalks. I think that, you know, what we're, 677, as we were saying, is a huge number within a four month period. Uh, we don't even really have a breakdown on, you know, which of those, how many of those are pedestrians, in fact. And uh, certainly we wouldn't have a breakdown on how many of those pedestrians are people with disabilities. I'm sure that's not something that anybody's tracking either. But um, my concern for people with disabilities in the city of Toronto, if we were to allow e-scooters to um, be used on the sidewalks, is extreme. I think that, you know, the, the items that were outlined by both of our speakers today are relevant, so we would see people with disabilities who cannot see them uh, potentially being run over by them. Uh, people with disabilities who use mobility devices already can't get around on our sidewalks uh, because of a result of lack of snow clearage, uh, signs, uh, things that are being sold, and now we're adding something else to the equation in terms of having a, a clear walkway or pathway for people who use devices. Uh, I, I. My personal recommendation is I would strongly reject um, the allowing these to be used on a sidewalk. As a pedestrian myself, I'm just in shock because also, you know, I'm, I'm a person with a disability. I'm a parent too. And the thought of walking along a sidewalk holding my kiddo's hand and having somebody on an e-scooter doing 24 kilometers an hour coming at us and I can see them and react uh, is quite shocking to me. So I'm. My personal opinion is that we should reject the option for these to be used on the sidewalks here. And I, I need to maybe come up with a motion if that's what I need. Anyone else to speak? Uh, Michelle, then Liv. Thank you for your presentation. So yes, I had personal concerns before even hearing the deputations. The deputations have strengthened what I was already uh, parsing through. I strongly reject the idea of e-scooters, particularly on sidewalks. I'm afraid for my own safety, let alone vulnerable populations, especially people with low vision, uh, folks that are elderly. I think about people with developmental disabilities in the community that we support uh, at my agency, and I think about delayed reaction time. Uh, in terms of being able to tie someone using an e-scooter to, say, some kind of collision, how this enforcement is going to work is very unclear. Um, having maybe the only barrier to renting be a sort of cognitive evaluation seems like it could potentially be discriminatory to people with developmental disabilities. So I have a lot of concerns, and I think overall at this point it's to reject it outright. And then, you know, barring that, I think uh, the deputation from David Lepofsky does have good outlines in place for what to do if they are going to be allowed. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, live to speak. My concerns are informed from my experience uh, on sidewalks in other jurisdictions. Uh, 
walking with young children um, and not feeling uh, safe. There's a, quite a potential for hit and run uh, sort of situations. From your numbers, um, of the number of people with facial and head trauma, it seems uh, like really quite a significant and dangerous situation and uh, we don't wanna see an increase in acquired brain injuries and traumatic brain injuries. Um, so I, I would I would also be very, very cautious about implementation, especially on sidewalks. We do have bike lanes. We do have e-bikes going on bike lanes. I, I can't imagine why these would be on the sidewalk when they can go up to that uh, speed. Okay, thank you. Anyone else to speak? Okay. Um, seeing none, I have a motion which I'm going to uh, move uh, and this motion is uh, and thank you Wendy for your uh, for your comments uh, she was she was very helpful in shaping it um, the motion is that uh, that this particular committee recommend the city council to, pr to prohibit e-scooters for use in public spaces including sidewalks and roads and request that any city permission granted to e-scooter companies be guided by public safety in robust consultation with people living with disabilities and related organizations serving this population and, uh, and I just very quickly will speak to it. Um, I think that, so this particular committee, our responsibility is to bring forward the voices and the concerns for people living with disabilities, working with organizations that represent the populations, and to inform city council wherever we can to make right decisions for the community. Um, given the coalition of members and organizations that have already, uh, you know, stated some alarm, I think what we need to do is uh, ask the city to number one say no to e-scooter uh, use um, in public spaces, especially sidewalks, and especially where are there other vulnerable users, uh, those who are pedestrians um, and children and the elderly, uh, and to ensure that if there is going to be permissions granted. And we recognize that city council can also reject the advice or disregard the advice of this committee. But if permissions are to be granted, then you have to do it in robust consultation with the population uh, who is living with disabilities and all the different stakeholders and organizations that represent uh, th this particular group. Um, I, I think that there's, uh, you know, to be quite honest, four, four months of use in Calgary, and perhaps their mistake was permitting the e-scooter use on. Uh, on sidewalks, um, but the challenge that I see is that out of the 677 ER visits, uh, those visits are, that actually made it to the hospitals, um, one big question from in my mind is out of the four months of use, how many people actually hurt themselves, hurt others, injured whoever, that decided that they were not seriously injured enough to go to the ER? I know I've had accidents on my bike and, and, and certainly I've picked myself up spra sprained and bruised, but decided that I could walk away or limp away from my own accident and not take myself into the ER uh, uh, facility uh, for immediate medical attention. And I suspect that there's probably many of us who've decided not to go into ER, but still probably could have used some medical attention. So the, the early numbers in Calgary are, are actually rather alarming. Um, and I think that the very minimum what we need to do is make sure we put the brakes on it. There's many times I say the city needs to be more ambitious. We need to take leadership on a whole host of issues and themes. I don't think this is one of them. I am encouraged to know that, um, that staff are working with other cities and other municipalities uh, to make sure that you can perhaps create a, a regional coordinated response. Uh, and, uh, and hopefully that the, the province is going to be listening. Uh, in, in sleepy little towns where there isn't a lot happening, perhaps this is very exciting. Uh, but for big cities with, with crowded sidewalks and as a downtown councillor who represents the busiest intersections, the busiest subway stations, the busiest used um, sidewalks in the entire country, I know that we have, I, I think that the, we should be uh, extra cautious uh, for that reason. Um, and thank you very much for allowing uh, me to speak. Uh, are there any questions of the mover? No, seeing none. Uh, then there's only one motion that's before us. Uh, anyone else to, to speak? Okay, so let's take a vote on this particular motion. All those in favor? And if I'm gonna ask for a recorded vote, please. Sorry, I should have, I should have warned you in advance. All those in favor, please indicate your support. Uh, 
for Councillor Wang Tam's motion to amend item, uh, those in favor, uh, Howard Wax, um, Karima Ewick, Councillor Wang Tam. Yes. Uh, Leif Mendelssohn. Yes. Uh, Michelle Patrit. Uh, Bhuvani. Uh, uh, yeah. And Wendy Poch. Uh, motion carried unanimously. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And thank you, uh, Janet, for your presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, that brings us to almost the end of our, our meeting today. Uh, we do have one more motion to table, and that's to excuse uh, some of our colleagues who didn't make it out, but they did give us notice that they couldn't make it. Mm -hmm. uh, so if the members can just hang on tight, I'm just going to read their names. Um, so I'd like to move that the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee excuse the absence of Miranda Frey. Thank you everyone for your participation. I'm really glad you were able to make it. We almost didn't have quorum, so big, big kudos to you. Uh, and we'll see you uh, very shortly at our next meeting. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, yeah it's you. a good meeting. Yeah.